can't discuss out in public. Uh, so now I'm going to do public forum. If there's anyone out there that wants to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government, speak now. Seeing none, moving on. Uh, town manager appointment. Um, the select board will consider confirming the town manager's appointment of Christopher Haymans. Is that how you say the name? Haymans? Yes. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, to the position of treasurer collector. Mr. Kamalu. Uh, through the chair, um, I think I have two things to point out. Number one, his name is Chris. Chris? Yes. Um, what did in, I say? I'm, I'm sure you know. Christopher. The, yeah, in, in all the interviews you've had, everybody has mentioned about uh, how we like hiring people named Chris in the oh. finance department. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. Um, I am respectfully requesting the board affirm the town manager's appointment of Christopher Heymans as the town's next treasurer collector. Uh, Chris, please. Yeah. And... Yeah. yeah, Chris is joining the town um, with uh, five and a half years experience having worked for BNY Mellon as the vice president, lead manager, and partnership accounting, senior supervisor. Uh, he also worked one and a half years with Kaufman Rosen Fund Services, uh, Citigroup Hedge Fund Services for four years, and he was at State Street for three years. Uh, he has uh, a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Um, when we spoke to his references, uh, a previous supervisor noted Chris's particular strength in developing internal controls and documenting business practices. I think as you have heard, uh, we are going full steam ahead in developing SOPs for everything that we do here at Town Hall. Uh, Chris's strengths include building commercial relationships with business institutions and stakeholders. He has particular experience in managing cash flows for multi-billion dollar portfolios of investments. Uh, he was professional, cool-headed, and service-oriented as a fund manager. Um, we found Chris very attractive for us in this case. Um, when we went into the hiring process, we were very open-minded. We understood that we may get applications uh, from the private sector as well as from the private uh, public sector. Uh, and having um, interviewed, I think, Chris, how many times? Three, four times? You went through, uh, I think, uh, two rounds of interviews. Uh, and then there was a final round which included uh, a problem that you had to solve uh, on behalf of, no, a problem that you had to, to solve presented to you by the CFO as well as the HR department. Uh, the first round of interview panels with the Chief Financial Officer Tim O'Leary, the Hopkinton Schools Director of Finance Susan Rothermich, the Town Accountant Dev Nalchajian, Hopkinton PT Administrative Manager Anne Marie Cordon, the Assistant Town Manager Elaine Lazarus, the Human Resources Director Maria Casey. Second round of interviews, we had the CFO Tim O'Leary, the Assistant Town Manager Lazarus, Town Accountant Nanchaljian, uh, Town Manager Norman Kumalo, as well as the HR Generalist uh, Christian Merrill. Um, again, his experience in the private sector uh, proved to us to be what we're looking for to continue uh, to improve our treasury and collection function in town. Nice. Thank you, Mr. Kamalo. Board members, have anything? Sure. Uh, Chris, I didn't catch it, but where, where do you live? Framingham. Framingham, okay, so it's not a bad commute. No. The commute in Massachusetts is one of the biggest drivers for people's happiness on the job, whatever it is they do, uh, because it's so hard to move around these days. Uh, great, I think uh, the background speaks for itself, uh, everything that Mr. Kamala just laid out there, so uh, we're happy to have you on board and I look forward to working with you. I'm Brian, by the way. Um, you won't deal much with us, uh, on occasion through him. Um, <laughs> he deals with us sometimes. But it's, uh, it's a great community and uh, we appreciate uh, getting more professionals on board and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you.
Or Joe? Yeah, I just have, I have one question. Your, your resume is outstanding. And um, you know, being a VP in the private sector and all of that sort of thing, I, my question is, why do you want to join municipal government? It's, it's a shift in my career I've been looking to take for a while. I've been pondering where I want to go from you know, where I was. And I've done a lot of time in the corporate world. Um, but I'm looking forward to having an opportunity to make a contribution at the end of the day and feel really good about what I do day in and day out. Fair enough. Well, that was actually very similar to what I was going to ask, is uh, why the shift from, public to pri uh, from private to public sector. I'm Irfan, by the way. Um, as a UMass grad, I'm uh, particularly happy to see you. Uh, OK, he's on. done. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great community. I think you'll, you'll be really happy here. Thank you. Good. So Chris, one question for you. You ever been stuck in a dryer? Dryer. I always look people's up Facebook. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that Chris probably has young kids that said, Dad, I'll give you five bucks when, and get out of that thing. <laughs> whenever we have a, an applicant, I always bring up their Facebook, and uh, uh, that's, you get some pretty cool stuff going on your Facebook. So. I'd recommend going there. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I don't think I can get out of that. <laughs> um, so anytime that Mr. Kamalu put somebody in front of us after their rigorous interview uh, panels, plural, uh, there's a good chance that they've done their due diligence, checked into things, done your background check, uh, and you've passed muster. So um, I don't generally second guess unless there was something maybe odd that might come up on a Facebook <laughs> page. Uh, so um, I, am, uh, I definitely feel that you uh, passed the muster and I'm Brendan, by the way, and congratulations and welcome to the town. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you. Uh, having said that, I will um, accept a motion to um, appoint. Uh, I move to confirm the town manager's appointment of Christopher Hamans as treasurer collector. Okay. Seconded. Anybody? Anyone? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Congratulations. Congratulations. Welcome to town. Welcome to town. This is great. Uh, <clears throat> next up is consent agenda. Uh, let's see. Number one, the select board will considering the 11-15-19 select board meeting minutes. Number two, the library gift. The select board will considering a gift of $750 from the Hopkins Public Library Foundation to the Hopkins Public Library to fund a lucky day collection uh, and that's it you don't want to break any of those out mr chair i move the consent agenda is written second okay any further discussion hearing none okay, all in favor aye. aye all opposed abstentions it carries thank you uh so we have a 650 public po a posted public hearing however it's not that time yet so we'll move on to the next uh, agenda item if we can. Uh, Mr. O'Leary, are you ready to go with your general obligation bond approval? Yes, sir, I am. All right, have a seat. While we're waiting, why don't we move on to the street name approval, Whisper Way. Yes, uh, the select board will consider approving a request from First Nation of 20th Century's Homes to name an extension of Whisper Way as Whisper Way. Uh, the planning board has approved the subdivision plan, which alters the layout to the end of the existing road and provides for a short extension. Mr. Chair. Yes. I could. So we have a road called Whisper Way today. That's yes. right. It was an extension requested by the planning board. Yep. It's an extension of the same road, and we just want to keep calling it Whisper Way. That's right. I move the request to name the Whisper Way extension Whisper Way uh, as presented this evening. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions? Okay. It carries. Tim, you all set? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you for Open up. Sure. I'm here tonight with paperwork to sign bonds in support of $9,175,000 in previously approved capital projects. In responding to our offering, we received bids from seven qualified investors 
with interest rates ranging from a low of 1.86401 to a high of just above 2.2%. I selected the low bidder, which was FTN Financial Capital Markets of Nashville, and our bonds will be issued on November 26th at the low 1.864% effective rate. That rate is the net effective cost of borrowing for us, considering all the 18 separate bonds that you're going to have to sign, which mature between 2020 and 2039, and they all have slightly different rates on the face of them. And when you aggregate all that math, it comes out to the 1.846% uh, with different amounts, different stated interest rates, and then these bond premiums that are factored in as offsets. Looking at the market at the time of our bid, it seems like our AAA rating probably saved us about two-tenths of 1% on the borrowing cost, which over the life of the bond is a benefit worth about $100,000. So the bucket truck, I don't know if, that's about the price of the bucket truck, just for having the AAA rating, so that's great. Of the 9.2 million we're raising, most of it, about 7.2, will replace temporary borrowing that was previously approved by the select board and taken to support various projects. Those included the library, the Grove Street water tank, the turf field at the high school, and the athletic field lighting. So we did all those with temporary borrowings. This issue will institutionalize that debt. In terms of where the money's flowing, about 5.8 million in proceeds from the bond will support general fund projects. 2.6 million supports the Water Enterprise Fund, $85,000 for sewer enterprise costs for the capacity study, and $720,000 will cover athletic field lighting. The graph that I had, I don't know if it can go up, but I think you have a copy, there it is, uh, is an update of the graph we put in the appropriation report for town meeting, and that shows where our annual principal and interest payments will be in the general fund after this borrowing. I believe you have a hard copy in front of you as well. The dashed line on the bottom shows what our debt burden looks like in terms of actual costs going out to 2047 with everything we've borrowed already, including tonight's borrowings. The little solid line that's above it includes a few more things that we were not ready to borrow for tonight because we didn't need the money right away. About $4 million in additional approved projects that we did not need to borrow for right now. Uh, so the benefit of that chart is it shows you what our, gives you a sense of what our borrowing capacity is going out as we look at other challenges in the town. The language in the motion you will need to pass tonight to complete the borrowing is on page 42 of the agenda packet. But I'm happy to answer any questions about this borrowing or our general debt situation. <clears throat> Mr. Herb? Tim, the year that that drops down uh, substantially there where the yellow line kind of kicks in as well, uh, what year is that? I can't see that. For That's long. about 20, uh, 22, 21, 22, and it drops precipitously from about eight and a half million in expense down to about six million in expense and going down the to the x-axis intercept 22 23 okay so um are you going to stick around for some of our later discussions about special town meeting articles and things like that yes sir okay because i think we're going to pull this back up again at that time um i would like to anyway if that's okay with the chair um we'll visit because it comes this up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll debate it then. <laughs> this is uh, indicative of where we are with our debt. Right. These are our mortgages. Yes. And these are our principal and interest payments right. showing kind of what's going on. And we see that a lot of things are going to be coming off yes. over the next several years, which is going to ease our, our expense line for debt and interest or, or principal and interest. But it's also an opportunity if we have to invest to kind of reinvest without hitting the taxpayers beyond what we're already charging because it's built into the current budgets. Okay. And um, you probably understand that and maybe I don't understand everything I say sometimes, but I think that's an accurate statement. Is that true? Th that's exactly accurate. And I have a couple fun facts if you want to just get a little background on this before we move to the next section or so let or me just talk about let this me just later. kind of finish with another thought though. But so this is this is our debt service and what's coming off the books, which is good because I know there's some 
initiatives to put other things back on the books. And my thing over the 12 years I've been kicking it around is debt service in the general operating budget at a flat line in that four to six percent range or whatever it is has been fairly steady and that helps us budget from year to year to year so this helps us look at what we can do for capital coming up uh, but my other question is in this borrowing of this nine million dollars is the corridor project involved in this borrowing at all the corridor project is involved uh, in part so eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars of corridor costs are in this project we've already spent 166,000 of that, and we believe, uh, based on current plans, to spend the rest of that in this fiscal year. And then we believe there's alternate funding to use for several years, and we'll be back for the balance of the town cost, which is 2.15 million later, like 2022. So when we did the appropriation for the $3 million, approximately, I'm yes. talking sales guy numbers now, which yes. is rounding to the simplest number, when we did the $3 million appropriation in 2018, Article 20, yes. for the three million bucks, we're now, we've spent some of that, we've worked up, we've used that, if you will, yes. because we were authorized to spend, and now we gotta go out and borrow to kind of backfill the books to cover that. Um, what happens if that, that $800,000 that you say we need to go get now, what happens if, this, if there's a challenge or there's an issue coming out of special town meeting that could cause problems for that? Okay, excellent question. We've already spent about $166,000 of that, and we believe an additional amount up to about $500,000 is committed for design costs, appraisals, things we've already ordered. We haven't paid the bills, but we believe we have contractual commitments. So $500,000 of that will be gone, will be sunk and left. And the other 350 that we have that we wanted to plan to spend to continue on the project, we've discussed this with Bond Council and our bankers, and we would come back to town meeting and to you and get that money shifted to support the new Main Street parking uh, lot, which is also one of the projects, a like project uh, that is not in this part. Of the thing, yeah. That's part of the four million we've we've deferred borrowing on because we're not ready to do that yet gotcha but bond council saying it is three hundred thousand of a nine million dollar bond uh they and, and it's still authorized today and it will still be authorized on the 26th of november when we execute the bonds they said that level of possible change is not enough to upset the bond issue so one of my thoughts would be why would we go out and borrow that 800k in advance of the special town meeting if we're going to waste, well, I guess we've already not wasted. We've already spent 500 of it. I guess we got to pay those bills regardless. Yes, Six, 660, right? Not 500. 660. Wasn't we've, we spent 166, and we have obligations that bring it up to about up 550. To 500. So oh, the five, 500. the 500. Yeah. So the 500 is the the 166 yeah. and the additional amount, 344. the 338, that we believe we're committed to. Okay. I'm not advocating we not go do it, but I'm just trying to understand what the risk is for the community. Well, so this bond process has been a lengthy process, and when we initiated the process and went out to bid and went through rating and bond council, there was no prospect of the Main Street Corridor not being done. We had absolutely no information that there would be a special town meeting, so we went forward through the whole process with the best information we had. The process itself costs about $100,000. So we are committed to going forward with this borrowing. Mr. Kamal, is there a, am I being a worry word here or is, do we have some risk here? We, I think as through the chair, as our team reported, we did discuss this issue with Bond Council. Uh, we have also discussed the issue with uh, Town Council. He's continuing to help us assess if there's any risk going forward. I'll just 500 add. grand is clearly, I mean, if we don't use what we've designed, I mean, I guess that's, right? Yeah, if, if, if 550 or 560 is already committed, there are contracts that go along with that number. So I'll, I'll just add that we have to pay off 5.3 million in temporary borrowing on December 12th, and we need the yes. proceeds of this bond to do that. And uh, if for some reason the bond got derailed, this, this borrowing got derailed, 
we would be facing more bid costs. We might be facing skepticism from people who bid on our bonds. I don't know what the liability would be if we walked away from our successful bidder. Uh, so I, I reviewed this with bond council and their advice was, given that you have other like projects that you could divert that $350,000 to, it seemed most reasonable to go forward with the bond issue. So we couldn't shave the 350 off this borrowing? We, we cannot shave it off because the die is cast, the papers are printed, I have signed it, your, your signatures are pending, and we have a November 26th deadline to close on this deal. So without walking away from the closing, which we haven't even explored, <coughs> uh, we'll just take that money. And, and, and we've tried to borrow the minimum amount of money to meet our needs. For example, we did not borrow for the fire truck because we weren't ready to use it for several months and we thought we could do a temporary borrowing in the early summer to accommodate that. So we have really squeezed it down, but uh, you know, if it were five million of the nine million, we would have had a much deeper conversation. But when the amount in play is 350 of the, and we need the 500 to pay the, the obligated costs anyways, when the amount in play is potentially 350, and we have an alternate plan, our commercial banker and the bond council felt the best thing was to stay the course. So, I'm sorry. I can open the hearing. Sorry, go ahead. All right, so I have to interrupt here for a moment. We have a posted public hearing at 6.50. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, open that, and, uh, and then we'll ask you to hold off. Uh, we'll hold off talking about that until we're done with Mr. Lee and uh, the general obligation bond. Mr. Chair, I move that the Board of Selectmen open the posted public hearing for the tax classification hearing. Second. Okay, any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain? Carry. Okay. Thank you. John, hold up. We're still dealing with Tim. <laughs> uh, if I could. Okay, so, yeah. so, you know, I, I've been pretty clear in recent weeks and months about my view on town meeting. I'm a purist when it comes to town meeting and the process of annual town meeting and the deliberative uh, debate that takes place annually and has gone on for 300 years. And now we have a special town meeting, but now you're telling me we have 865K or so. It's in the, in the midst of that discussion, and I'm struggling with borrowing 865 grand if we don't know if we're gonna need it, or I guess. So it's 350. Well, okay, well, we're gonna need 500 to pay the bills that we've already right. incurred, but the $365,000 so as a purist, the town meeting, the town meeting vote was for the corridor project. The town meeting vote in 2019 was for the, okay. Okay, so the town meeting vote for 2019 was for the parking lot. So we could, for a like project, do that. Go back and the council. get that done. Yes, sir, and, and our, you know, after discussing it with the attorneys, our view was town meeting voted to do this. We have moved forward in a reasonable and expeditious manner to do it. This borrowing is part of that. Town meeting has not undone that yet. So today, as of today, the position of the town meeting is that this project is going forward and until it's repealed. And so I think this, the basis for going forward is sound and the economic reasoning for going forward is also sound because to stop and interrupt the $9 million borrowing on the chance that town meeting might reverse course has tangible costs. So it's really a $9 million obligation that this is tied to now and not just the 865 grand. That doesn't make me feel any better, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit more money, right? So now we're, well, then, I know we have to do those other projects, but the manner in which we're doing it could be very, very costly. Um, sir, uh, the for example, the library work has been completed. We did it with temporary borrowing. We need to do this bond to permanentize the borrowing and pay totally the bill. Agree. The fields, same thing. Totally the water agree. tank, same thing. I mean, 5.5 million of this, 9 million has already been banned and we need to satisfy those bans. So there's, those are things that the town meeting voted to do that have been done, that we have borrowed appropriately for uh, through temporary borrowing that we now have to permanentize. The, the scale of this is that uh, it's the $350,000, which we, we 
cash we would be holding and paying 1.8% interest on, and the risk is we're paying 8.14% interest on money we might not need for this purpose, but bond council has indicated we could shift it to an alternate purpose. Uh, and then the cost of not doing it is the $100,000 we spent to issue the bond, and then we'd have to scramble to satisfy all our other obligations, because this is our plan for meeting our existing uh, temporary borrowing. Does that so, make sense? And I apologize for all these questions. Am I the only one that this is causing a little angst from, for? Or? Um, it's not causing it through the chair. It's not causing any angst to me. Um, the way I'm kind of viewing this, and using uh, simple terms, it's just kind of refinancing a bunch of debt and kind of putting it all under one umbrella. Um, so as I understand it, the entire nine million is committed at this point, yes. but there is a chance that there may be 350 left over afterwards, which could be applied to a separate project, right? Yes. But the, out of that nine million, there's only the 350 that's in, in question. Everything else is basically refinancing prior debts. Or, or some new starts. Nine, but 97% of the money is on track for its intended purposes, irrespective of what the town meeting outcome is. It is the 3% tied to the Main Street quarter, which could be in doubt. And I, I shared your concerns. I became very concerned about this and whether we could sign uh, with this looming and the bond council said that we could and that it makes economic sense to do so so i don't i i didn't view it as presumptive toward the town meeting right now we're standing on town meeting approval of that project and it seemed that we needed to act as if that that approval has standing and not presume that the town meeting is going to change course we don't know what's going to happen whatever happens will be compliant uh, but this is a compliant path to meeting all of our obligations at the lowest cost. Yeah, I guess I just I see the 865k or whatever is that's the number in my head. It's tied to that project coming out of that town meeting that's at risk. Um, maybe 350s. What's left at risk? The other 500s at risk too, in, in many ways, right? So, okay, I understand what you're saying. I'm good. Just. Uh, the other 500 would be a sunk cost if we abandoned the project. That would be the cost of abandoning the project and starting over with a different plan to renew Main Street, unless there's other costs I'm not aware of. But th th that money would be gone because we would have a design that we would not be using, and we would have appraisals that we may not use. So, so that would be one of the things that people might consider when thinking of changing course is that we have invested money already okay thank you yes sir Good. Uh, just one last a uh, couple little questions um out of the 860 or uh, 850 that uh of the prior prior debts and the new new starts if we just focus on the prior debts are we Effectively lowering our rates, so, so we those are those are temporary borrowing. Temporary that, borrowings. So it was a temporary borrowing at a higher rate than what we're. What I, we're you know, I don't recall what the ban was. It happened right when I, uh, like my first few weeks, Mike was up here and he came in with a ban. We can borrow at good rates because of our rating. So the temporary borrowings are not bad. The nice thing about the bond is now we're locking in for 1.8 percent for a very mm -hmm. long time, and you know there's a yield curve so the farther out you go you typically pay more mm -hmm. so it's pretty good for us to lock in the the uh this rate for the long term now okay. thank you i'm all set okay we're all set all right Tim, thank you so um as your parliamentarian i do believe we need to okay. take a vote yep. to authorize the CFO to uh, there's got to be a written motion somewhere. It's on 42 of the package. In, in fact, if I may, the board may move a motion as presented in your meeting packet. I think it's a five, six page long motion. Yeah, we're not yes, reading it. it. <laughs> okay, Mr. Chair, I move that the board of selectmen approve the uh, general bond 
obligation approval uh, as detailed in the board of select board packet for this evening tuesday november 19th 2019 uh, as written second okay any further discussion hearing none all in favor aye, aye. all opposed abstain carries Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And I, there will be a signing party later, I guess. I got it right here. Yeah. A lot of money. <laughs> so, if I may, through. Yep. Yeah. Dissolve. Go ahead. Um, as we have announced at previous select board meetings. I was just going to do the same thing. Go ahead. Uh, Bills? Yes. Yeah. So, if anybody here is parked at Bills uh, Pizza over there, uh, that is not the town's property. We don't have a right to park there. Uh, and. They are well in their right to tow your car. So if you're parked there, uh, they are very uh, unhappy that we have, uh, rightfully unhappy that we kind of monopolize their back lot on occasion. So if you're parked out there, I would suggest that you move it or you will more than likely have it. Thank you. All right, back to our posted public hearing. <laughs> Mr. Nees. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> To the select boards and citizens of Hopkinton, the Board of Assessors is here to inform you about the um, decisions that you're to make tonight, so give you some information so you can appropriately make the choices. Um, there are four different items on the agenda that you need to vote on. One is selection of the residential factor or whether to shift the tax burden from the residential and open space class to the commercial, industrial, and personal property class, and if so, by what percentage. Number two is whether or not to grant an open space discount. The third is whether or not to grant a residential exemption. And the fourth is whether or not to grant a small commercial exemption. Now, all four of these, um, either sh because they are lowering the tax rates on some groups or on parts of some groups, raise the tax rates on others. And many of them, as you can see in the letter, um, there are very, very few communities that actually vote for them. Okay. What we wanted to touch on before John Neese, our principal assessor, goes into the actual graphs was just a little bit of information about the, cur the current single family property uh, assessment, which is at $632,500 uh, compared to last year where it was 599000 so about $600,000. Um, the new growth for the fiscal year was 134920 ish thousand. Um, as opposed to last year where it was 131.3 million. Um, the largest categories that we've had in the new growth include a single family class at 23 million 100 thousand um, and then the condominium class at 59 million 395 thousand and the personal property class at 32 million 226 thousand. Um, the most significant contributor has been the growth of condominiums. So this year we had a total new amount of condominiums of 1,293 units, and that was about an average assessment of 361,000 compared to a total of 970 condominium units and an average assessment of 399,000 last year. Um, so the Board of Assessors, which includes Leslie Fikari and Guna Madi, uh, will now turn it over to our principal assessor to go through some graphs for you about comparables. assessors and my staff and the CFO and the town accountant for all the work they have done on this issue as well. So I'm going to take you through uh, just a few PowerPoint slides, make some comments for you, and I will be happy to uh, answer any questions you have as well. 
So the proposed tax rate for fiscal year 2020 is $16.83 for residential property and $16.81 for commercial, industrial, and personal property. Now, as always, these rates are subject to some minor variation um, while we go through the remainder of the approval process with the Department of Revenue. They usually don't change, but they could change, uh, they could change slightly. Um, I would like to make it clear that even though we are showing a different rate on that screen, that this is not a split tax rate. That is uh, simply a function of the new means-tested senior exemption uh, that you voted for this year. And the typical exemptions that we have every year uh, for blind, uh, elderly, seniors, um, CPA, veterans, and the Senior Workoff Program are all funded through the overlay account, so they have no effect on the tax rate. Is that Gold Star Families as well? I'm sorry? Gold Star Families as well? Yes. So this is a copy of the legislation, and I know you are familiar with it, but it makes it very clear that the total amount exempted under, this, under the new means-tested senior exemption shall be allocated proportionately within the levy on all residential taxpayers. Um, and no exemption shall be granted until the Department of Revenue certifies a residential tax rate where the total exemption amount is raised by a burden shift within the residential tax levy. So I just wanted to point that out to you. So in general, the different classes of property have increased from uh, 2 to 10 percent. If we go to the next one, this just shows it to you a little bit graphically. And we have, as usual, uh, for the residents, uh, not available until tomorrow or the next day, but we have two notebooks uh, in hard copy. They get uh, placed on the assessor's counter uh, and in the library. Uh, and we also put the information on the website. But it contains a, an alphabetical listing of every property in town uh, by street address uh, with the prior value, the current value for fiscal 2020, the dollar difference and the ratio difference. So every resident can look at what their particular individual property increased by. It also includes the uh, printout on the personal property values in town. Uh, and then it includes uh, a property record card on all of the arm's length transfers uh, for uh, calendar year 2018. So if uh, oh, we've gone to the next one again, this just shows graphically the split that is in the letter, uh, but basically we are an 84% residential community and a 16% commercial, industrial, and personal property community. If we go to the next one, uh, again, just graphically shows the difference in value and the difference in tax uh, over time. Uh, the column on the far right is fiscal year 2020 and shows what Leah has um, told you is an average residential value of 632500 for a single family. If we go to the next one, uh, this just shows the average tax bill for a single family property over the same period of time. Uh, for fiscal year 2020, again to the far right, uh, an estimated annual tax bill of $10,650 or about a 3.5% over the average annual tax bill for the previous year. If we go to the next one. Um, you have asked before and like a comparison of Hopkinton, which is the second column from the left, uh, as opposed to some other communities in this graph, it's compared to uh, Holliston, Medfield, Southboro, and Westboro. We'll go to one more. This shows you the effect of shifting the tax rate uh, or going to a split rate between uh, residential property and commercial, industrial, and personal property. Um, I'm not advocating for anything in particular, but we wanted to show you that the blue uh, is that if you shift um, the tax rate by 5, 10, 15, 20, or 25 percent, uh, the blue will show what the reduction in the average annual uh, single family or residential tax uh, burden will be uh, and the corresponding increase to that uh, 2A property in the commercial, industrial, uh, and personal property class. John, that's based on the 84-16 breakdown? 
Yes, it is. 84%, 16 Yes, it is. And it shows, unfortunately, in Hopkinton, because of that split, a disproportionate uh, difference um, by saving the, the residential taxpayer some sum of money. And I can go through those numbers if you'd like. I have them on the chart. But um, the uh, corresponding increase in the commercial, industrial, or personal property. And two more. This shows the uh, excess levy, uh, again, over a serious, uh, a similar period of time. Uh, and then the last slide, and I'll be happy to take questions, but um, when we started the presentation, um, it was suggested that you have to take a vote on all of these issues, whether or not to grant an open space discount, whether or not to grant a residential exemption. Uh, and again, that is separate from the means tested exemption because that's already been approved whether or not to grant a small commercial exemption and whether or not to have a single tax rate or a split tax rate. Uh, and the LA-5 needs to be signed by the majority of the board at the end of your meeting in order to uh, move forward in setting the tax rate. So I'm happy to entertain questions. Um, so are there any questions from the board members? Mr. Hur, why don't you start us? Um, the 8416, I believe that's a little bit of progress. I thought it was always 8515 for the last 30 years. I can't tell you exactly, but it's been very similar to the 8416 split over the last several years. Okay. Yeah, it's been 84. All right, so it's a All right. Um, you mentioned a 2020 excess levy of 300 some K. Mm -hmm. I thought the underride cleared the excess levy, or was that just through that fiscal year and then it carried over, some carried over? You agree with the tax excess levy, right? right. I'm going to sort of pass that to the CFO if he, if he can help, but the excess levy number on that slide comes from the LA-5 in the gateway system, which comes after the entry of the total value of the town and the split between the different classes of property and it will give us that excess levy figure. So I know there have been some differences because of your underride, and if you look back at the previous year where you were at 1.9 million in right. excess levy, I'm thinking that maybe the 342 currently is a result of that underride. But I, I believe know. that's how the mechanics of it work. So we just have to generally to chip away at that if we wanted to completely go away okay. for f several years to make it fully go away. I, as long as the values I keep going if up. If you wanted to do that, you would have to do it every year because I think you, you could grow some new excess levy in the process because of new growth. Because of the valuations too. In the valuation of the new growth. I think yeah. I think if that was your strategy, it would require an annual action to do that. Right. So the dialogue around the underride, the last underride, the third underride was this will wipe us clean. So it wiped us clean in that fiscal year, okay. but it didn't wipe us clean going forward. And this could this will grow again too. So Okay, not a bad problem to have. And if I could back up for a minute, so I didn't know that I had the paperwork, but for fiscal year 2020, the residential uh, portion is 83.9412%. The balance would be commercial, industrial, and personal grouped together. So 83.9412. For fiscal year 2019, the residential portion was 83.6661. Yeah, it's definitely slightly tweaking downward, which is not a bad thing. Right. The, the bump this year, sir, was in personal property. There was a $32 million bump in personal property, in part because of the efforts of the assessors to identify new assets that have been not been captured before. Good. Do you want anything? Our friend? Yes. <clears throat> Just wanted to ask about the open space discount um, what would that specifically apply to is that like if you had wetlands that are unusable or is it just um, something approved by the planning board as an open space area so let me see if I can answer it this way um, first of all there's a, a little bit of a misconception of the open space classification so you can have chapter land for example uh, or you can have excess land with your own residential property that is sort of open in appearance, wooded, uh, recreational. Um, that's not what we're talking about when we, ha when we talk about the open space classification. 
Um, and wetlands, for example, you know, already receives a discount in our, uh, in our CAMA system. The open space is a specific state classification code of 201, and generally um, in Hopkinton, not generally, but pretty much in each case in Hopkinton, it includes property that the planning board previously had required a developer to retain as open space in a new subdivision. Okay. So would this also, um, would it also apply to like uh, land that has a conservation restriction on it? No, but that, that would be, uh, no. you know, wetlands um, or land that is undevelopable um, or something with a conservation restriction uh, would have a lower value by virtue of some type of discount in the system, but still would not receive an open space discount. Okay. So the total tax revenue from open space is under $2,500 town-wide. The valuation is only $143,000. Okay. So the, the whole pool is... is uh, I think we report it because it's a category in the state. And for, for an open space discount, there is only one community in the entire uh, state of Massachusetts, which is Bedford, that has an open space discount. Mm -hmm. okay. um, does it have an open space discount? It does. It yeah, does. Only Bedford is so the only one that does. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll go through this. So we're good for the board. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a public hearing. So would anyone in attendance like to comment on this? Terry, come on up. Thanks. This may not be the subject that we're on, but it has to do with tax revenue. It's something that I've been thinking about for a few years. It has to do with motor vehicle excise taxes. And is there a way to make sure that everyone that's moving into town is re-registering their car or truck or any vehicle in our town? My suggestion might be if we took a list of the last not last year, but the year before that and the year before that. And if we brought that group of names up on a list as new owners in town, could we then compare that, that each one of those is paying excise on a vehicle or two? Is that something that's uh, legal? Like, I, I'm certainly not going. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, at first, to be honest, I think we'll, we'll take the suggestion under advisement, but I think the answer is probably yes. The Registry of Motor Vehicles has a brand new computerized uh, system, so I would think that we could do some kind of a cross check on that, but I can't tell you without talking to them. Yeah, could you look into it? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Terry. All right. I just want to make a comment. Um, having been in that chair many, many times presenting classification hearing, I just want to thank Leah Battle Rafferty for taking my place. <laughs> <laughs> We're missing your cheesecake. <laughs> cheesecake? All right, so <laughs> saying no more comments, uh, I will um, look to the board to close the public hearing. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none. Okay. Uh, ready to vote on that? Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? Carries? Okay, so now it's board deliberation. Who's got what? Or have we already done? So we have four questions before us. The yep. open space, and maybe we can put those back up on the screen there to kind of help us gut walk through it. Um, and this process over the years has been a very consistent, predictable process as far as at the board level goes. We haven't changed our mind on this in a long time. Uh, I just want, to, just want to refresh my memory anyway of where have we voted on these four questions in the past. I know the single tax rate is yes, we stay with a single tax rate. Because that's been the past. I'm not saying yep. that's what we're doing tonight, but that's the past. Um, 
but the small commercial exemption to residential and the open space, I'm trying to remember because I don't, I know we voted those in the past, but on all those we've been consistently a no. Is that right. accurate? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so fair enough with that question. My next question is specific to the commercial, and I'm a single tax rate person, so that's where I'll go, but I, this question has come up a couple times in about the last two years, maybe three years now. The commercial rate, while we're staying with the single tax, so they're not getting that huge spike because we're bailing on 2% right. and they're picking up 20%. Right. Um, we're staying with that single rate, but their valuations have changed, and it's as my understanding that it's gone from more less of a square footage and general appraisal valuation, building condition, size, et cetera, location, all those typical variables, to a, more of an income-based valuation or an income per, uh, piece of the puzzle is added into the other all the whole valuation. And that has changed the valuations of some of these commercial properties, some of them not knowing that this was going on and some frustration with that piece of the process. But this income valuation addition, that is new to town, is that a fair statement, within the last couple of years? Yes. Okay, so it's new to town. So it was new last year and it's done now. So the, it's a new normal now. It's, it doesn't happen again every year. It is a, the impact was felt last year and we do not believe it will be felt again this year. Does that make sense? We Got shifted it. methods. Got it. And the baseline has changed and now we're back in a trajectory that is less uh, erratic. Okay. Can you say one short explanation? I mean, there are three standard approaches to value cost sales and income, but income producing property is usually sold and purchased by investors on an income basis. So, for the longest time, they were valued essentially by a hybrid cost sales comparison approach, which is not the way those properties are transferred. So, we made a decision a couple of years ago to make income producing property valued by the income approach to value. And as Tim has said, that has been completed so that future values with those properties should be more So before we get in any further, I know we've had a whole bunch of more people show up here. You all have to know that if you're parked in Bill's, uh, Bill's Pizza a lot, if anyone's parked there, they're going to start towing cars. That's not our lot. We're not able to park there. So if you're parked there, you need to move it. Okay, so back to the income valuation question and I can understand that it would be that one year spike or variation someone up well up, someone down obviously too because it's still balanced out but it's my understanding and talking with some of the folks in that in that world and I do some business in the, in the commercial real estate markets as well the income valuation is tied to the credit worthiness in a lot of cases of the tenants in those buildings and not the buildings themselves so the income coming to that building and the, the, the value of that tenant and its credit worthiness is a formula that th that industry uses to gauge their revenue streams for future years and things along those lines. Um, and there's some question about how, do, how does the town understand the income opportunities in some of those businesses or those commercial real estate uh, owners' lives or businesses without getting into the details of the of the credit worthiness and a lot of other sort of private information that may or may not be available to the public in the public domain i'll start with a short answer and i'll be happy to expand uh, if you want i like the smile on your face that tells me something's coming <laughs> but um we are authorized under uh, the statute to uh, require uh, income producing property owners to supply us with their income and expense information every year. So we send out um, through the mail a request for that information with a list of instructions and a form specific to that individual property. They of course as an individual property owner have the option to supply us with that information or not. If they don't return it to us we send out a second request. And the second request, the first request as well, but the second request will remind them that they have 
uh, probably lost their right to appeal their value to the appellate tax board. That's in the, that's in the language. Uh, that they um, will now face a 50 or a $250 fine, depending upon the class of property that it is. Uh, and we have instituted that fine in Hopkinton because we are constantly told by the Department of Revenue that we have to do a better job of collecting that information. So that's one way to do it. Uh, they also um, run the risk of not getting what you might refer to as a certificate in good standing. So if uh, they apply, they have a new tenant who wants a new sign and they apply to the tax collector and they have an unpaid portion of their tax bill um, or this fine on their property, then they cannot get that permission you know, to do what they might want to. Um, so, to further answer your question, we try and collect as much of that as we can. We have about 160 commercial or industrial properties. We get at least 50 or 60 to 70 percent of those property owners to return that information to us. With the ones that don't return it, we have to model their value based on what we know from other owners. All that information is confidential, but if we know that people are paying a certain rent for a a uh, barbershop um, or a pharmacy or a restaurant, then if they don't return the information, we can use the information we have to model the income on another property. That information all supplies us with income information, and those owners are more than welcome, number one, to meet with us at any time, or number two, to supply us with that information what they believe to be the credit worthiness of their tenants. Their uh, I'm not sure how else to explain it to you. But their credit scores or anything like that don't come into play at all. It's their income and expenses, the, what they're actually doing in terms of money. Mr. Chairman, so can you just add a data point about this year? Because we have the experience from this year today. We developed it this afternoon and looked at it. And uh, I'll give it to you very quickly. The whole commercial class did go up by $16 million or about 10%, 10.4% this year, but 13 million of that was new growth, new construction, mm -hmm. new renovations, improvements. For the, for the group that excluded new growth, the increase in valuation was 2%. So I think some people may have keyed in on the 10% idea that the values were going up 10%, but that includes both new growth and the market value. Our assessment this year found market values went up two percent, two point zero five percent in that category. So, so the, the the process of reaching out to the commercial building owners and getting that information back is that somewhat new too, or has no. that been going on forever? Thirty years. Okay. I was doing it when I was the administrator in the assessor's office, sending out the income and expense forms every single year for at least 30 years now. So I think- Before that also, but. Based on what I've heard in town over the last couple of years, and you know, we kind of know some of the folks that have spoken up about it, I would suggest we, I'm gonna table this thought for right now, but when we come to future agenda items, I'm gonna ask maybe that if we have a, a joint meeting with the Board of Assessors, the team, everybody sitting down together, uh, and we talk about this and we invite some of those folks in and hear what they're talking about too, I think that would help all of us understand the process, but also understand the expectations going forward too. Uh, and I think that would, I think it would go a long way in sort of resolving some of the concerns some folks have. If I could just comment, I think that would be a wonderful idea. And I did in fact meet with that committee, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, Economic Growth Committee or something like that, with a lot of these commercial and industrial property owners to explain this situation to them. But I'd be happy to have that meeting with you. Yeah, if we all do it together, I think that we can cover a lot of different bases at the same time. So we'll do it on a future agenda. Thank okay. you. I'm good. All right. Leslie? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, just, I just wanted to say also that John has done a good job of reaching out to these folks. And he is very focused on bringing in the revenue to our town. And so what you might be hearing, Brian, is that he has been a little dogged about going out and getting that information. So where things might have fallen through the cracks before, where he's a little bit more, and Ruth and, and um, Stuart are on top of this much more. So that yeah. might be what you're hearing. Yep, that's fair. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. All right, so I will entertain a motion, uh, four motions, I guess. 
the more time. So I move that we do not grant an open space exemption. Second. Mr. Kamal, is that motion in order? It's in the negative. No, it's second. Oh. Yeah. So move, move the motion through the chair. Do we have a motion doc for these? Yeah, yeah. we do. So I move. I uh, request a motion to not grant an open space exception. It's or <laughs> I, no. I, I recommend wording it differently. I move the motion as granting, and then the board will vote the way it sees fit. Okay, so we want to grant them. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's the same thing. So it's. I request a motion to grant an open space exemption. Exactly. Okay. okay. If they do it, doesn't matter. So moved. Well, we just, it was moved already. It just needs to be seconded. Second. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. You made the motion. I read it. So it was made. By you? Yes. Okay. Second. Okay. <laughs> Any further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> All opposed? Aye. Aye. <laughs> 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 I get it. We okay. don't want to ask the question. So this is, yeah, you said no. I caught. Okay. <laughs> you got half an eye out. <laughs> All right. Okay, I move to uh, grant a residential exemption. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? And opposed. Aye. 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 And abstain. Carries. <laughs> I move to grant a small commercial exemption. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? And opposed? Aye. Aye. Uh, carries. I move to approve a uh, single tax rate for fiscal year 20. Okay, 20 any further discussion? Second. Oh, yeah. Sorry, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions and a carry. All right, thank you, ladies and thank gentlemen. You. Um, thank you. Nice, nice presentation. Uh, nice job. I just signed the LA5 form for the Mass Department of Revenue. John, I'll second that. So I will do a second. Oh, yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 We'll do the LA5. Yeah. I will do a. Um, okay. Uh, future right. agenda item to have a So, show. seeing that the time is at 7.30, we have a public hearing for a street acceptance for Legacy Farms North. Uh, the select board will hold a public hearing pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 82, Subsection 21 to discuss accepting and laying out Legacy Farms North from Franklin Road to Wilson Street as a public way. There will be an article on the December 9, 2019 Special Town Meeting Warrant requesting the acceptance of the street as a public way. The special town meeting article has been submitted by citizens' petition. Um, Mr. Chair, I move that we open public hearing for the street acceptance of Legacy Farms North. Okay. It's second. 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 Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? It carries. Okay, we are open. Um, so the select board as road commissioners is required to hold a public hearing prior to any town meeting vote to accept a street as a public way. The street acceptance process is, select board refers the street acceptance proposal to the planning board. Select board holds a public hearing and approves the road layout. Select board files its vote layout with the town clerk at least seven days before town meeting. A town, I'm sorry, a plan showing the layout of the road must be filed with the town clerk at least seven days before town meeting. Let's go through the items one by one with the dates required. Um, so the first requirement was notify property owner of public hearing. That was done on November 12th. Refer article to planning board. That was done November 13. Public hearing notice to town clerk was done November 13. Select board hearing is what we're doing right now. Uh, the deadline for select board to file its layout vote with the town clerk is December 2. The deadline for a layout plan to be, to be filed with the town clerk is also December 2. The deadline for planning board report, uh, planning board has 45 days from November 13th, which is December 28th, but this is after the special town meeting date is December 9th. Following a town meeting vote to accept the street as a public way, there is a taking process whereby the town establishes ownership of the roadway and drainage of other, and other easements that go along with it. We have received written comments from the DPW director, from the conservation 
administrator. Would a representative of the citizens petitioners like to make a presentation at this time? Okay, come on up. Name and address, please. Ravi Gordy, 15 Spruce, Spruce Street. 15 School Street? Spruce Street. Spruce Street, okay. Okay, go ahead. All right, um, good evening, everyone. So uh, we just wanted to thank you all for giving us this opportunity to talk about the Legacy Farms Road school issue that we've been facing for a while. For a while. Um, a, we're, uh, as you all know, Legacy Farms is, uh, a lot of the residents in Legacy Farms are relatively new residents to Hopkinton. Um, most of us have moved here one and a half years, at the most two years ago. And uh, we've been uh, trying to, uh, the, ever since the first resident moved in, into Legacy Farms, we were hoping uh, the school bus stop issue has been a concern and a lot of us have brought it to the attention of a lot of the, uh, the decision makers here. But unfortunately, despite uh, all the, uh, the meetings and, and despite all the effort, we're still struggling to, uh, that nothing has happened here yet. It's uh, the, all our efforts are kind of training us and, and it's kind of unfortunate that we're uh, having to do this um, as, a, as a citizen's petition uh, as a last resort, but we definitely are looking for uh, to cooperate and come up with a solution that works for all, but uh, we're, we definitely want to talk about a solution that I think will uh, help alleviate the issue here. Um, so can I just, uh, can we see the slides here? So I just want to uh, point your attention to just two slides here. The first one is just, uh, a lot of you have seen these photos already, but I wanted to point everybody's attention to uh, slide number five here, which shows the extremely long line of cars uh, waiting for the bus stop in the mornings. And also, you have the same issue in the evenings as well, uh, in the afternoon when the school bus drops the kids back as well. How many cars is in that uh, I have, slide? I would say at least 30 cars. And in fact, this one, that's, uh, you can see there, it's about 30 to 35 cars. And there are 30 to 35 kids on the bus at that one particular bus stop? No, in fact, what we do is, because there's, there, obviously there's no parking spot, uh, place there for all the cars, we carpool. Each car has between uh, two to three kids at the minimum. So there's 70 to 95 kids on that one bus and, stop? Yes, and uh, especially the elementary school uh, pickup time, yes, there's quite a few kids. So do we have a, well, I guess we don't have a member of the school committee here, but is there a school bus that we have that has a capacity of 95 kids? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's, uh, I'm, I'm not saying all cars have three kids in them, but some of them have, uh, we carpool, but I. So if there's 35 cars there, there's a minimum. At the minimum. Minimum, 35 children. Absolutely, yes. At, at for one sure. bus stop at one yes. time. Yes, yes. And uh, I think uh, I'll just move the, um, so we've talked about a number of potential solutions and we've, we've also talked with uh, Mr. Wrestling and, and a lot of other, um, employees of the uh, town of Hopkinton. And uh, we have a list of items that uh, were expressed as concerns or items that need to be finalized before uh, the Legacy Farms Road North is accepted as a public road. And we just wanted to talk about uh, some, uh, some of those concerns uh, and what we think we should be doing, which is, so this is just a, a quick list of the Mr. Westerling's uh, concerns from his email are items that he wanted to, questions that he wanted answered. And we were proposing that uh, we just have a discussion about which of those items uh, Mr. McDowell is, is willing to pay for and which of those items uh, he's not uh, going to be paying for. And then I think in terms of next steps, we would like to have a, a memorandum of understanding to uh, make, to kind of uh, tie it down and then proceed to the next steps. So Ravi, I just need to let you know that this is, we have a certain, we have a, a, a amount of time that we're allowed to allow you to do your presentation. Yep. And I, I want I, you to get in as much as you possibly can before we have to cut no, you. No, I'm done. I just All wanted right. to give an opportunity to my, uh, my neighbors to express some of their concerns as well. Or is, is that possible? Mm -hmm. yep. So, um, so before we open it up, 
to the public. Um, you know, much as we've done, there's been a lot of um, items that have come before us recently that right. brought a lot of um, community spirit. So I don't think there's probably a lot of people that are here to speak against this. So what we ask you to do, if you're going to come up and comment on it, if you have a comment, we don't want you to parrot the next person, the next person. So if you have a, uh, a point that you think after the first person speaks, if the next person comes up and just says that I'm in favor and I'm in favor and I'm in favor, uh, we get it. We know that you're probably in favor of it. Yes. Uh, if you have a, uh, another selling point, something else that might, uh, that might get us to raise our eyebrows, then by all means. But, you know, sure. we need to cut off the... Right Makes sense. Right. Yeah, we only have 30 minutes to get it. <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks. So uh, that said, is there anyone out there uh, that wants to come out and have something to say? Come on up. Tell us what your name and address is, and sure. you get two minutes. Sure. Um, my name is Nikhil Kapoor. Um, my address is 27 Walnut Way. I don't have a lot to say. Um, the only thing I would kind of urge again to consider this more seriously is because the new house is being built right now. The line of cars that you see, the, the problem is only going to get worse with us trying to find a spot so we can par park our car in either rain or snow, whatever the weather is, and try to kind of drop our kids to safely to the school bus. So I just want to consider that there gonna, there's going to be more houses built, and, and this might more. get a little bigger issue in the process. That's all. Thank you. Yep, thanks. There's a lot more houses to be built. Ravi, as the spokesman, what would you say is the percentage of people at the bus stop that drive their children to the bus versus the percentage of the people that walk to the bus? I would say a majority of them drive to the bus stop. 95 5, 70 30? 95 5, close it in that for sure. Thank you. Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm Radhika Sangreddy, and uh, I reside in 15 Spruce Street. And uh, I am the mother of a, a 11 year old lanky daughter who is in sixth grade. And um, as probably most of you know, with like the uh, higher demands of education, right, like compared to what I have seen in the previous grades, now my daughter has to carry a laptop, she carries gym gear, she carries a viola at times too. And when the weather is good for her to walk back, <coughs> which is like close to a mile, it's difficult. Right? Like she's carrying all of these and it's not an easy and I'm not saying that um, it's going to get any better in the winters, right? Like if she has to also get the winter gear. And apart from that, it, it makes me concerned that that road is not necessarily a private road. It's a public road and the cars are zooming by and it, it, and it concerns me. And it, I am working and I feel like it's been rough the past. We moved here from New York and we moved here thinking that it's going to be a great community and I've been really happy with everything that Hopkinton has given us so far, right? Like, um, we, love the, we love the town, we love the school, we um, love the people around us and you know everything that I ever wanted, I'm getting in Hopkinton except for this feeling of anxiety that I have to you know, figure out how is my daughter going to get to school. I looked at care.com, looked at hiring somebody who is charging $17 an hour and at least wants to come for two hours and it's not even like a guaranteed support because it's a temporary job for them, right? Like nobody wants to just be making approximately $600 a month doing this work and it's not even a consistent source of support for me. So I feel like it's affecting my personal life. Like I get anxious at work thinking about how am I going to do this? I have two graduate degrees and I've struggled hard to get to where I am right now. And I feel like I shouldn't be taking this burden on top of everything that I'm already doing. So I'm hoping that it takes a village to raise a child, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that this village will help raise all of these children to help parents make it easier for us. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All citizens are allowed to speak, right? Sure. Okay. If you're good with her being on the television. <laughs> Is it okay if I sit next to her? Absolutely. Yes. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Arushi Shea and I live on 44 Spruce Street. 
I'm here to request your help about changing the bus stop as proposed. I use this bus stop and I have personally experienced the many dangers and inconveniences that this brings on a daily basis. Please help me and 200 other Hopkinton students in making it safer for us to get to school every day. Thank you. Thank you. That took a lot of courage. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Try to beat that. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Kala from uh, One Juniper Trail, Lexi Farms North, and thank you for giving us this opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm just going to add into what my friends put forth uh, about the, the difficulty of the situation. To me, it looks like it's increasing. It, it's increasing almost exponentially with each factor around. Like kids keep like they said, kids keep increasing and the line of cars gets longer. I park my car, even if I come 10 minutes earlier than the bus, I'm the 25th car. That's almost halfway through home. It, I can just walk from home instead of that. So I park the car and then we have to walk all the way. Um, and then we carpool, like he said, it's, it's two, and I, like I carpool with three kids. And, and when the kids see the bus from far, they scram. They're like, oh my god, the bus is here. And, and, and getting to control our kids and the other kids uh, whom we're getting familiar with um, is kind of a difficulty. And, and then to add on that, the traffic, I, I guess it's except for the Hopkinton school buses, everybody else treats it like a public road. Um, so uh, with, with no speed limits and people pass and uh, the bus flashing its lights or not, either ways. So we've seen all those scenarios and it's kind of scary. It's an accident waiting to happen. We have to take care of the kids. So, so the traffic is adding to it. And then comes the rain, the ice, the snow, and um, the line getting longer is making it difficult for us. So it's, 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 just, it's, it's first for the kids, the school bus, the safety, and it's also for all of us that it, it would be better if that road be treated properly. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So we realize it's not easy to come up here and speak in, in public. You guys are doing a good job. <laughs> it's easier for some. Good <laughs> my name is Srini Vijay from 19 Juniper Trail. So my neighbors have spoken about how difficult it is to get to the bus stop, how difficult it is to maintain the kids in the bus stop, to get into the bus or get off the bus, get into the car, go back home. I'm here to throw some facts that we uh, try to pursue a few options and what it is uh, like for us for the past couple of years. Uh, I'm sure Roy McDowell here knows more uh, on these facts because he has also been helping us uh, in the due course of uh, trying these options. So we tried a few options before we got here with the citizens petition. Option one was, uh, though this road is treated as private, is there a way we can get any other commute uh, through a different private vendor to drop the kids either at the bus stop or to the school? And the cost of that was skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. Roy tried it very diligently to see if there is a possibility. And the second option that we had was luxury uh, coaches or buses, uh, which was way too expensive, <coughs> 350,000, 400,000 uh, per year for us to get that in. And nobody is willing to do that for that amount. We can as well make the road public, make it even more beautiful than what it is right now and have the public traffic go by. So the last resort, what we are trying to achieve here is move the citizens' petition. Though the road is private, there is an empty number of traffic that bypasses 135 to take this road for 85 north and south. Um, and this is fresh from yesterday when I was picking up my kids from the bus stop along with other uh, two kids from my neighbors. A pickup truck literally passed. 10 seconds. Sorry? Yeah, 10 seconds. Sure. My, the pickup truck literally passed us. And I was waving hands. He wasn't even apologizing to do that. And the school bus driver was uh, talking praises that you have to keep doing it. Like, we can keep doing it, but it's not going to work out. So we request everyone here uh, to consider this road public as soon as possible and help us alleviate our pain. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it?
Hi, this is Arpud Raj from One Juniper Trail. Uh, I'm just adding a, a one more point with, with uh, my community friends. Uh, so the, the process of getting you know this uh, issue get resolved is started like two years back. Uh, the lots of people and then people getting added now, and then uh, we're still trying to get it. And if you see like uh, if, the, if the road is going to get accepted as public road, you know all the construction has to be completed and those kind of you know uh, lots are there, but. It is forecasted as like you know it will take minimum of uh, around four years to complete uh, the construction, so the road can be accepted as public, and then the process may take another one year or so. So, this you know whatever the problem we are facing is going to have like another five years minimum uh, in the down the line. Uh, so, just wanted to mention that point here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Roy McDowell, Legacy Farms. Um, I understand the neighbor's frustration, and frankly, I, I don't disagree with it. As, as was mentioned earlier, we tried to spend significant time with bus companies offering to buy extra insurance for them, 183's Main Street. None of that seemed to work. So what we're doing is we've signed a contract this past week with Western Nurseries. We're going to be doing the entire planting on that road this spring, ideally late March, early April, whenever the weather's conducive. So that we're going to get done before the end of April. We want to pave the road right thereafter. We want to completely finish the road, ideally before town meeting, but at least in May. So we want to finish the road. We want to finish the seating of the shoulders. We want to finish the planting. We want it fully complete. Now, that being said, I saw, I got a, a copy of a letter that the Conservation Commission sent to you that, that they're afraid, they're concerned that if you approve the road to town meeting, that number one, the road won't be done. I will tell you there's a bond outstanding that's more than twice the cost to finish the work. And I've said here in public, we're gonna do the work first part of the spring. The other concern they have is uh, if there are any outstanding issues because the town has approved it, those would now become the town's responsibility. I have no problem signing a contractual letter that if there's anything that needs to be complete, we will take the responsibility of that, even if the town has approved the road. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Playing a little hurt tonight, sorry. All right. <laughs> Uh, Miro Kramer, 39 North Street, also the chair of the planning board in Hopkinton. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity um, to speak tonight. Um, I appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, we understand that we are um, supporting the energy and the effort that is a little bit outside of regular process. Um, the road itself is a little outside of regular process as well. And I think that we can all agree that the town is benefiting from this intentional bypass road that offloads traffic and one of the concerns uh, with the bus bus situation that I notice is that the traffic does not stop as the buses load and offload because of the design of the adjacent streets um, I personally recognize that that this might not be possible at this juncture um, I would like to think that we could all engage in the problem solving I really applaud the residents who have been persistent, patient, done an awful lot of work to put the facts in front of us. I appreciate the developer who seems to be willing to do what um, needs to be done to make this possible. Um, if uh, the planning board is, uh, is in full support of finding a way that is legal and practical, pragmatic, increases the safety and acknowledges the fact that we have, we have for all intents and purposes accepted that road two and a half years ago when we had a big ribbon cutting. And I'm, I'm told that that was thanks to the planning board of its day. Whoever, whoever invited everybody, whoever cut the ribbon, whoever invited all folks to, to use the road as if it is a public way, um, I think that there is, there is uh, some responsibility on, on all of us to find a way to increase the safety here on the road. And I think that none of the construction, none of the housing construction is going on on that bypass road. It's a slightly different situation. 10 the seconds. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, the planning board has asked the town attorney to, f to uh, inf help us understand the best way forward in a different situation to make this possible. So I'm just here to ask everybody to jump in with these lovely parents and these wonderful families um, and help us find a solution that really does work and work for the long term. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Nishit, 37 Spruce Street. Uh, how can I show a slide here? Can you help me? Thank you. I just want to highlight, uh, sometimes you guys have seen these photographs. I just focus on these two photographs. Uh, this shows one view of uh, coming from Franklin Road intersection towards the Legacy Falls North. But assume a similar way, it's a curve here, right? As ma'am highlighted, it's a curve. As a father, when I stand this morning, uh, I ask my daughter, please stand behind me because if one of the driver is distracted and is over the phone, he will barge over all of you kids. And this thing has happened in past in many other places where a distracted driver just hit the kids. This damage is, is not worth required, it's not expected. Uh, we should not worry about this as a parent, neither should this town should. I don't know what the technicalities are. Uh, these, my neighbors have been working on it. You guys have been working on it. Roy has been working on it. Uh, but I just want to request all of you to come together. What are the apprehensions everyone has? Just please consider safety of kids above that. It's appeal of father. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're all set. Mr. Terry. Thomas Terry, 17 Maple Street. I was glad to hear Mr. McDonald speak of his gracious offer to take care of us in case there are any backfalls that we might come upon. I would suggest maybe he would increase the bond rather than have it done with just promises. The bond is, what is it, $775,000 now? We can increase that bond to a million and a half to two million. It could take care of some of the possible contingencies that might turn into large expenses <coughs> later. And uh, I'm sure Mr. Westerling wants to speak too. And I know the Conservation Board has sent a letter out. Did you read the letter? Yeah, got it and read it. Yeah. And that's very important that this letter should go into the readings of this, uh, this, this uh, someone should read that letter if, it's, if it isn't a handout before, uh, well, you're the ones that are gonna vote. I have a one question. Um, when Legacy South was, was built, um, there was a while that they had to come up to East Main Street and they, were, they got on the buses there. That went on for like two, two and a half, maybe even three years. And that was all, that, Legacy could do for them, which was fine. I hope the people that are sitting in the back tonight don't think that the buses are going to pick those kids up at their house. Those kids are still going to have to walk the hill. And that hill's like a quarter mile just like this. I'm sorry. You're going to have to get in your car and you're going to have to bring your kids up and you're going to have to park them along the side of a road. It's going to be called North Road. Not North Road where it is now, it's gonna be North Road up a little further. True, probably 30 or 40%, being very fair, might be able to walk to that area. The other 60% of the people are still gonna to have to be transported by car. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Uh, I would suggest that Mr. McDowell gets involved with this a little more extensively, since some of the projects that he said we're gonna do haven't been done, like the sidewalk on East Main Street and uh, the traffic light. So to think that all this is gonna be planted and done by April 30th, all I know is Christmas is the 25th of December. <laughs> and Roy McDowell can't tell me that this is gonna be done by April 30th. So Thank you, Mr. Terry. All right, so 
there's no more public comments, uh, I will entertain a vote to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions? It carries. Um, board deliberation. Points to consider. Uh, the construction of the road is not complete. What is the town's liability in this regard if it accepts the road? The statute requires that a layout plan be filed with the town clerk at least seven days before a special town meeting vote. Is there a plan showing the layout for the board to refer to in its vote? Or will there be one? Um, uh, and I'm going to, Mr. Kamalo, there, there are no answers to those two questions, right? That we have right now? The, the, I mean, I have not yes. seen a plan. Yeah, we, we have not received a plan. We you, you have received the escrow <coughs> plans from the Ludlow when we built the road. You do have those. Um, if you don't, I can get them again for you. That'll be helpful. We need Mr. Westerling. We need Mr. Westerling. Mr. Westerling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do or we don't? There's no in between. Through the chair, we do have the record drawings of the road as it was constructed up to base course, mm -hmm. but I don't know if that conforms to the requirements of the layout. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And that's the plan that Mr. McDowell's referring to. So let's just, if we could on that yeah. one point, don't run away, Mr. Westerling. The layout plan is the as-built drawing of everything along that roadway. Is that a fair statement? It's the projected. I don't believe it's the as-built. The as-built can't be done until after everything is built. Well, right? that's what this typically is, and that's when right. we typically accept the road. That's why I'm asking the question. Mr. McDowell. When Ludlow built the road, they built everything, sewer, water, gas, sidewalks, base coat paving. So everything has an as-built. The only thing that's remaining is the finished coat of asphalt and the planting. Other than that, there are as-built drawings for all the utilities in the road itself, the contours, the grades, everything. Okay, so I'm fairly sure those we handed to the town, but for some reason, if you don't have them, we can get them for you. So do you have all those various plans? Again, through the chair, we have the record drawings, the so-called as-built plans through the base course and all the utilities. But my understanding of a, a layout plan is more of a meets and bounds of the actual yeah, that's what I mean. and the easements of the actual road layout. So, yeah, so that's why I'm asking this question is this. I think there's a lot more to this. And please, folks, don't read into my questions here about where I'm at on this whole thing. I'm just trying to get some facts figured out first. The layout plan that we typically vote and accept the town meeting we've done forever has all that other stuff in it. It has the landscape plan that I would know you would do a great job with. But we need all the other stuff. We need all the legal easements. We need everything included in that. We don't have, I'm not aware of anything like that. I, I, I will find what you do have, and for whatever reason what you don't have, we can get you. Quickly? How soon would you like it? It's, it's 8 o'clock now. We've got a special <laughs> town meeting. We have dates. We already have problems with I mean, dates. We can get you what exists. If for some reason there needs to be a survey or something like that, then that's obviously going to take probably a week or so if it needs a survey. I don't know if it does. I'm not saying that this is your issue or your fault, this well, no, situation. It, it, I, it is what it is. You know, but, it's the old expression, I'm trying to help you help us type mm -hmm. of thing. So I think we're all rowing in the same direction. So the question is, whatever you need, I just need to know what you don't have so I can give you what I have. And if there's something beyond that, I'm happy to pursue it. Okay. And I've had many conversations with you about this as well, which is something that I'm going to bring up towards the end of this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I've got other questions and comments if I could. So Mr. Ted Stone outlined, the chair, outlined a process that is typically followed in Hopkinton in, at the beginning of this op uh, uh, public hearing. And you listed various steps along the way and various dates things had to be submitted and various dates things had to happen uh, in advance of the town meeting. Uh, several of those, the timeline for those to happen is well after the town meeting. So as the as the chief executive officials for the town of Hopkinton, we have a problem in that we want to help, but the process as we have it today, frankly, doesn't allow us to help tonight because we don't have everything sorted out. We don't have this plan. We, don't, we can't vote on accepting that plan and many other, many other things. So there's a, there's a challenge with that. Um, 
I'm a little surprised to hear about speed limits. Is the chief of police still here? He is. Chief Lee, this is our chief of police, folks. Um, does an excellent job on behalf of one of the safest communities in America to live. The safest. The safest. The safest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, including an arrest yesterday yeah, or today, awesome whenever it was. was um, is there a speed limit on Legacy Farms North? Uh, I believe it's uh, 30, 30 miles an hour. Is it posted? Yes. Okay, so. But there is a, a slight problem with it being a private road. It's uh, tough. Can you enforce that speed limit? Can we put a radar sign up there saying, folks, it's 30 and you're going 50, we can, we can slow do down? Preventive measures. Uh, Have we done that? Um, we did um, at the beginning of the, the school year, and uh, we've had extra patrols up there, especially when it gets a little slick out with the ice and things of that nature. But. Okay, so it and sounds we, like we have a safety thing outside this whole discussion. And if there's anything the department can do to increase the patrols, get the rate, get the, the, the flashing sign up there about the speed goes, and let's make sure we have speed limit signs posted across that, that whole length of road. I, I've gone up there several times. I don't remember seeing a sign, but I'm usually not looking for it. So, um, Okay, and then there was another comment uh, a minute ago that um, the bus will or may not go into the neighborhood itself to pick up the kids. I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I'm not on the school committee. I'm not on the transportation committee within the schools, and I'm not the business officer for the school. But I do think that the buses likely in a neighborhood of that size will make their way into some portions of that neighborhood and set up three or four stops. I don't know. But to say that once we do all this, they're still going to have to come all the way out to the north road, I'm not sure if we can say that's necessarily the case tonight. So I just don't want to create any confusion out there. I d we don't know where the bus is going to go. That's the school committees and the yep. school business transportation. directors, transportation directors. But in where I used to live in town, which is another neighborhood on the far west side of town, uh, the bus came into that neighborhood even though there were some main roads nearby. Um, so let's, we'll get some facts on that before we go too far. So in general, Mr. Chair, and we're at board deliberation now, or discussion anyway, uh, here, here is my thoughts. For 300 years, Hopkinton has been developing as a once very rural community, and now it is a bustling Boston suburb. That's a fact, okay? With a lot of great characteristics to it, with great schools, great people, a lot of new people moving to town, a lot of energy, all kinds of really good stuff. But we have a process in place that's built for a town, or a process in place that's been set for a town that's developed over a period of 300 years. Nothing like the development we've seen that we voted on as a community, just so everybody in the room knows, the town made a decision not to buy the land. The town made a decision to let the developer move forward with the development that so many people now enjoy living in. So we knew, the town knew what was coming, but we didn't adjust some of the things that we probably should have adjusted to figure this situation out. I don't think we anticipated this situation, frankly, because I was on the board at the time. Mrs. Kramer was on the board at the time. Mr. McDowell did a great job working with the community back then. And um, busing and not being able to pick up 75 or 85 kids on a wet, nasty morning like yesterday or today or whatever it was, we didn't, we didn't talk about it. I know we didn't talk about it. I'm the father of five kids. I have five kids that have gone through the school system. She's a mother of five kids. Six. So six, sorry, 11 between the two of us. Uh, so, and there's all kinds of other kids uh, represented here too through parents. So I think as one member anyway, our challenge is we got to find a way to help you and I want to help you, but I also have all these laws and these rules that I have to follow as the chief, chief executive officer or one of them for the community or we could create other problems not only for us, but for you guys and the developer. So that's the, the conundrum that we're in. I'm all ears and I'm wide open to trying to find a, to try and find a solution. I don't know what that is here tonight, but I'm a big believer in life and business, whatever. There's always a solution out there. Sometimes it's painful to find it, but I think we still have to work together to find that solution. I'm not sure if we can pull that solution off at special town meeting, to be very honest with you. I would like to, but I'm not sure we can just yet. If, if others can figure this out in the next couple of weeks and we can get the deadlines met that we have to meet and we can get other sort of um, 
town council input that allows us to, to, to sidestep one or two regulations along the way to make this happen, I would support that because we as a town for 300 years have developed, as I said, in a way that was controlled and measurable. And then we voted as a town to create a new development, a new you know, village, if you will, in the community. And some of these things were anticipated. So I think that's on all of us to try and resolve. I'd like to find the answer to it. I don't know what it is just yet. So just so you understand where one member is coming from. Mr. Masula. You know, I think everything um, Mr. Hurst said is, is entirely appropriate. Um, I'm deeply sympathetic with, the, with this issue, and I want to find a solution. I just don't know if accepting the, the road is the solution right now. I mean, I think ultimately that's what we need, where we need to be. Um, and I'm not sure that we can get it all in order in time for town meeting. That said, it doesn't mean that we will not keep working on it. And we want you in our face. Keep coming back, because there's got to be another solution. If we can, if we can, if, if we can't accept the road now, then there's got to be an interim solution in the meantime. It's something that we can keep working on. Um, Safety is of utmost importance. And one thing I would just say is. Uh, if you know who's speeding and who's running around, <laughs> take down <laughs> take down the license plate, call them up. I mean, they're likely your neighbors. Call them up and say, what are you doing, man? Slow down. This is, this is of utmost importance, and I think um, there's, there's something that, you know, we need to find some kind of solution. I'm with you. I want to find a solution. I don't know uh, what it is yet. Mary Jo. Well, <laughs> I'm all for getting school buses to children and uh, something that we absolutely have to do. And I don't know whether it's going to be some kind of preliminary acceptance or some kind of acceptance with codicils or, or uh, what we can do yet, but we'll promise we'll work on it. We'll keep working on it. Into something. Mr. Chair. Um, Sorry, are you <laughs> leave the chair? Um, one thing that Ms. McDowell had mentioned was um, signing other other documents um, to ensure or to give us comfort that the work will get done. Um, is there anything in particular that yet yeah, was it appropriate for me to ask him directly? Uh, anything in particular that you had in mind? Is there anything in particular you had in mind that you were willing to sign in order to ensure that these that this work gets done, or are there any other kind of interim measures that you had well, given any thought to? One of the things I mentioned, we signed a contract with Western Nurseries to do the planting. Now, whether that gets done or they go through the process, we still have to Where are you with the Conservation Commission? Uh, the Conservation Commission will have to, we can't sign off for
I tried to put them on the finished paper in their roads in the next couple of weeks. And a little bit of work they're doing, I think, will be done this winter. Mm -hmm. So paving in the spring, there will be no more of that back and forth across from the east side to the west side. I think that's pretty much done. The work we're doing now is coming out partially up Lagos and north and then turning left. Or they'll be going out Phipps at some point. Mr. Hurt? So a couple of other thoughts and as I'm thinking through some of this. You know, one of the challenges before us tonight, we've, we've closed the public hearing portion, at least for the public input, but the hearing itself is still ongoing because we're in deliberation. But we're, as part of the process of getting ready for special town meeting or annual town meeting is we would vote to accept the plan, right? You just heard, we don't even have a plan to look at. So how are we going to mechanically do that tonight? I actually think you do have a plan. Yeah, but Roy, in terms of what we're supposed to do tonight, because this is live democracy in action here, I don't have it. It's not on my iPad. It's, it's, no, it's not iPad. It's not anywhere. So how do we vote on a plan for that? The, the second thing I would say is perhaps we should continue this public hearing to another day because we have a couple more meetings before special town meeting, and that could give us some time through the planning board and their process and maybe some process of ours within the town manager's office, work with Mr. Westling, work with the developer and see if we can figure something else out. Because if we vote no tonight, that's a problem at special town meeting because the mechanics won't have been checked off to get something done at town meeting itself. If we vote, I mean, it would be, it would be logical to vote no because we don't have a plan to vote yes on, right? So that's why I would suggest maybe we continue this a little bit. The other thing I would suggest is that we think about, so you folks, the, the petitioners have submitted a warrant article. And the, I put my hands up like that because Muriel will know what I'm talking about here because she's a former assistant town moderator. There's four corners to that article. And when you get to special town meeting, you're hearing a lot about four corners. In other words, the article warns the residents that this is what we're going to talk about for this issue. And you got your debate, dialogue, and everything has to be inside the four corners of the article. We can't talk about the Legacy Farms wastewater treatment plant during a debate about the Legacy Farms busing situation. Okay, so you got to stay focused on the article. And then beyond the article, there's the motion. And the motion asks town meeting to make a decision on, on the, the topic at hand. So the motion could be, we move that the town of Hopkinton uh, bypass all its rules and regulations and accept the Legacy Farms North Road as is with the bond supplied by the uh, developer for five years to finish the work, something like that. Or it could say, we move that the town of Hopkinton direct the Board of Selectmen and Planning Board to jointly work together to create a means in which to accept this town road here after town meeting concludes, uh, as long as the following have been met. So that's a little bit different motion than I think you might be per con considering at this time. And that would, I think, maybe give everybody a little bit of flexibility to actually get it done right, not only for the town, but for the residents and legacy farms too. What that would do is maybe delay things another month or two, but I don't think it would push it out that much further. So something to kind of noodle on as petitioners uh, and maybe something to the planning board as well as ourselves to consider too. But I, I don't think we have enough information to kind of really continue here this evening. Um, and if we do continue and, and things don't go the way I would like to see it go, then we're kind of dead in the water and then it puts off to another, who knows, we could be having special town meetings every month for a while, like, mm -hmm. from what I'm hearing. Um, but yep. it could go at least till next annual, to next May. So just something to think about. That's all I want to say. So, um, so Mr. McDowell and I <clears throat> have had discussions. Um, the, there's nobody sitting in this room that doesn't put the safety of all of our children as paramount. Absolutely. There's Brian, Muriel, they've got 100 kids. I've got two. Um, we, you know, my kids have to walk 700 feet to a bus stop, but that's just my driveway. Um, but nobody, nobody is trying to compromise the care and safety of your children uh, for, um, 
for a couple of dollars or or a couple of million dollars. Nobody is nobody wants to to, to exchange those two. Um, Mr. McDowell and I had a discussion, um, and it involved many different departments. What he had offered, and and what you guys presented was all very true. What you left out was the fourth option. The fourth option was a lot, a parking lot on the corner of East Main and Legacy that Mr. McDowell offered to come in, strip the loom. I spoke to him a week, I think it was a week before school started, and he said he probably couldn't have it done before the day of school starting, but within the week. <coughs> strip the loom, strip the subsoil, bring in gravel, grade it, compact it, <coughs> pave it, so many, many cars, many cars could go there safely and maintain it plow it, the whole nine yards. Everybody was on board. Every department that was on that was on board. Mr. McDowell was on board. The school committee was on board pending the approval of a Google poll that went to the neighbors. And, and if I'm not mistaken, the data that came back from Dr. <coughs> Kavanaugh said that 82% of the neighbors were not interested and coming up with that because it was an extended distance from the ex existing bus stop. So there's sometimes, I do have a little method to my madness. When I asked you what the percentage, what you thought the percentage was for drivers versus walkers, so 95%. So if 95% of your children were in a car and you were driving maybe 100 yards, <coughs> maybe 400 yards, maybe half a mile, The safety of your children on that Google poll said to me, you are more concerned about the distance away from your house than the safety of your children. No, nope, you may not talk. Nobody can talk. We're in deliberations now. This was a plan that was amenable at zero cost to the town. The transportation company had agreed to change their route to pick the children up there. Mr. McDowell agreed to pave this lot with 67, however many cars it would take to take care of that, plow it, maintain it until the, everything was done and they went through the normal channels and approved the road. Your anger and concern is certainly understood here and it's well taken. The, the fly in the ointment, as I see it, the transportation company just flat out refuses to go down this road. So lost in all this, um, all this hysteria on the, on the um, road approval, the quick road approval, is the transportation company. If the transportation, and, and we, we asked them and we begged them, Mr. McDowell begged them, everybody asked them, what would it take? We offered to, Mr. McDowell offered to pay for the rider to increase their insurance, and the transportation company said no. So again, I'm all for the safety of your kids, and I'm sorry if the message that I'm portraying now may make you think that I'm not, but our job as the, as the Board of Selectmen in this town is to follow policy and procedure, and to make policy and procedure. So as of right now, as Mr. Hur said, and Mr. Nasrullah agreed. The way that our policy and procedures are set up in town, I don't think that we have enough time right now to get this on the special town meeting our, uh, warrant. Well, it's on. I mean, the, uh, to have the article. But I think that, I mean, I don't know, I haven't spoken to Mr. McDowell since it was, since that Google poll shot it down. I don't know if he would be amenable to still to doing that. but. That was, a, that was a, a, a solution that I thought was very amenable to the town um, at a low cost, if no zero cost to us, and it would have provided all your safety. So I don't know, uh, that's my point of view. So you can all sit there and shake your head and disagree with me, but that's my point of view. Okay, so, but, but so we're, we're done. So the way, and, and there's you know, the process of how we do things in a town meeting form of government, which we are, is there's open hearings and then we close the hearings so that we can then debate with each other, right? We did close, we, we voted to close the public hearing, yes we did. Um, so, 
so you gotta bear with us while we do this, okay? Um, the problem is, with all of this, if you put the map of this neighborhood back up there and Legacy North Grove Normal past it, mm -hmm. there's four or five logical places where a bus is eventually going to stop, mm -hmm. okay? So I don't think the folks are looking to try and get everybody having the bus in their front door beeping the horn and, and having somebody run out you know, with their lunchbox late. Yep. It's they're gonna get to those four or five spots, right. which is not an unreasonable request. Right. So why would we just say it's the parking lot or nothing if we can figure out a way between now and special town meeting to actually make that happen? I'm absolutely amenable. I'm absolutely amenable. Look, I thought you were just saying no, this is I'm my saying, own thing. I'm saying this is something that was presented back before school started long before the special town meeting came even into play and it was shot down by a Google poll. So, okay. So if we can get this on the, on the, I mean, if we can make it so everything works and it, and it doesn't leave the town on the, on the hook for potentially hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars, then I'm all for it. Don't think that I'm not for it. But I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, everything has been presented. There have been, you know, ABC, D was left out, D was presented, and it was shot down. But if the citizen's petition is on the warrant, we're signing yep. the warrant Friday morning at 7 a.m., yep. whatever it is we're doing it, and it's gonna be on there. We yep. don't have a choice of that, because okay. they did their job, yep. okay? So now, it's a matter of, beyond getting on the warrant, the petitioners also have to have a bunch of boxes checked, including the select board doing their thing, before town meeting can say it's in order and can actually have a, pro a positive vote to, to accept, okay? And that's what we're talking about now. So your, your position is not just the parking lot or, any, or nothing, nope. but you're just arguing that that was a legitimate <laughs> that was there, yep. interim yep. Solution, solution to the problem. Okay, yep. and maybe that will be discussed on town meeting floor as part of this inside yep. the four corners of the, of the article or, the, or the, of the warrant. And if, this doesn't, if it doesn't go at town meeting, I'm happy to discuss with Mr. McDowell to see if we can get this thing taken care of still to make sure that your kids are safe. If it doesn't go at town meeting. So what do you guys think about the idea of just continuing this to a future date? Mr. Kamala, can you weigh in on all this? Uh, <clears throat> clearly, continuing the hearing is an option uh, with the understanding that uh, the select board hears until December, 20, no, December 2nd, yeah, December 2nd to uh, file its layout vote with the town clerk, uh, as well as the layout plan to be filed with the town clerks. I'm sorry, the last piece. The, as well as filing the layout with the town clerk's office. So it's both the vote as well as the layout. <clears throat> Mr. Deegan, are you in agreement with that? Uh, that is the timeline for it, yes. This is your town clerk, folks. He's the one that tracks all this stuff. Okay. So um, to chime in on the question of, of continuing, I mean, I think that seems to make logical sense right now. Yep. So if there is a chance of getting the, everything we need before special town meeting, then let's do it. Yep. Let's get it. If we can approve it, we can get it all done. I'm, I'm all in favor. Uh, my, my, my hesitation is, can it be done in time? But if we can continue and give it a try, let's give it a try. So. For the continuing meeting. For the continuing the yeah. meeting, yeah. So if I could, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. McDowell, a lot of this is going to fall on you to meet the criteria you need to meet to make this happen. Can you make this happen? Well, uh, I can make happen what I can make happen. It may be that there are things that weren't done on this as built, so I don't know until I look into it tomorrow. I'll have a better idea tomorrow what was given to us and what was given to the town needs to be the as built drawings for the road, but I will pursue it. And let's say Mr. McDowell delivers, is able to deliver in good effort and good faith, which he's always worked under in Hopkinton, he can deliver 90% of it. And let's say we can approve uh, somehow some of that, and then we send a special uh, message to, t to town meeting through the moderator that, um, you know, the motion needs to have certain things in it because we can we couldn't pull it all off and maybe that would be something that could work and then we could really get this thing going so I, I i have hope that we can figure it out but i again look to mr mcdowell he has to kind of meet his obligations 
as best he can, and then Mr. Westerling's got to get the rest of it sorted out in his mind and with town council, and then get it in front of us as soon as possible. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would suggest that we table the, uh, or continue the town meeting to a future date. We need a motion for that? No motion is needed. Um, again, to be clear, the board is continuing its deliberations. Yeah, we will, yeah so we will continue the deliberations uh, at yeah. a future date. The public input, we got it. You guys want this done. We're yeah. trying to figure it out. So we don't need to hear that again, but we got to figure it out. So I would, yep. we don't need a motion for that, but we'll continue okay. the deliberations. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Okay. Can I say one quick thing? <clears throat> I think another option in the meantime, too, is to uh, kind of split, split up that bus stop, have one on each end, then we're only going to have 15 cars at one, 15 at another. I can uh, work with the, the school bus coordinator on uh, something like that, just a, a small temporary fix, just so you don't have that volume of cars, 30 to 45 cars. And I'm sure the, uh, the busing company you know, would be amenable with that. It, okay, sounds so easy. That yeah. Have you <laughs> tried to uh, deal with the transportation sign? company? Assign certain families, uh, certain okay. bus stops. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're Thank you. Okay. Let's move up. So our next um, agenda item on our meeting tonight is special town meeting. Uh, so I would certainly suggest that you all stick around uh, because it has everything to do with you guys are, I believe, one third of uh, what we have on the docket for a special town meeting. So uh, we would certainly hope that you would stick around and, and uh, chime in on that. All right. All right, so for the first time in my chairmanship, we are behind schedule. Yes. <laughs> uh, so now the select board will consider matters and articles regarding the special town meeting on the December 9, 2019 special town meeting. Mr. Yeah, through the chair, this is purely an administrative update. Uh, just want to remind the public that the special town me meeting one and closes November 21. Uh, to date, we have received the following articles. Number one, there is a citizen petition regarding the Main Street Corridor project with two components. One, rescinding uh, Article 47 vote from 218. Second piece uh, is uh, a request that town meeting direct the select board to seize all work relating to the Main Street Corridor project. Uh, the second petition is the one that the board just discussed. This is in relation to Legacy Farms North Road. We have also received um, four articles from the uh, school department. Uh, the first is requesting a sum of money uh, to complete the feasibility, schematic design, engineering, and related services uh, for the renovation, alteration, and associated improvements uh, at the Hopkinton High School. Uh, the second article uh, is requesting funding for um, the construction, reconstruction, renovation, alteration, and associated improvements of the Hopkinton High School. In other words, design, mm -hmm. provide the uh, d uh, documents that are required for the construction, uh, and if approved, then move forward to the construction. And then third uh, is a request for a sum of money for the engineering, design, construction, reconstruction, renovation, or alteration, and associated improvements related to the purchase and installation of modular classrooms at the Elmwood School. And then the fourth article also is a sum of money uh, for the engineering, design, construction, reconstruction, renovation, or alteration in associated improvements related to the purchase and installation of modular classrooms at the Hopkins School. So those are the four articles from this uh, school department. And again, uh, the warrant is open until November 21. How much are these sums? <laughs> yeah, um, the numbers that have been put forth, um, in, in terms of the design, I think the number that is put, for, put forth is 500,000. Uh, the number for the high school uh, construction work is 4.5 million. 
uh, the number for the modular classrooms at Elmwood is 2 million and then the number for the modular classrooms at Hopkins School is 3 million. Would all those be bonded, Mr. Kamala? Um, Meaning a borrowing? Based on past practice, the, the last three years, um, there may be options uh, to address the first one, which is the design. Which is 500, okay. Yes. Uh, would, ha would that have to be, would those numbers have to be inside the FY20 budget? Because the special town meeting is now, or they still have to wait till July one to be fully appropriated. It, it it depends on when the projects may be executed. We haven't had that discussion. We just received this information this this morning. <clears throat> so if I keep going, Mr. Chair. Sure. So mm -hmm. um, if you're for those who are watching earlier, we had a chart up by the CFO showing the debt service numbers for the community over the next 20 or 30 years. And it showed that, and the reason why is, it showed a big drop in the debt service numbers, meaning what we have to pay on an annual basis, because the Hockington High School, which opened 20 years ago, is coming off the debt service schedule next September. That's a big reason why some of that's happening, along with a couple other projects. Uh, I suspect the fire station might be in that number too a little bit. Anyway, um, so while $10 million when we're all sitting here right now, special town meeting, $10 million, what the heck? Sounds like a lot of money for a little old special town meeting. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused about how that money would come to be and would it have to wait until July 1. But I'm not too concerned about it if the community believes we need to act on these projects because that debt service schedule is going to allow for some investment uh, in the community, uh, in the schools again, if, if, if that's what we decide, uh, without really breaking the bank. So it sounds like a lot, but the debt service on that can fit in that graph, I think, mm -hmm. pretty easily, based on some of the other things that we are carrying. What's our total debt amount at this time, and coming out of those, in that debt service schedule, Tim, what is that number? Is it 60 million or something like that? You no, know, I don't have it with me right now, sir. I, I have it downstairs. I think it's closer to like 70 in the yeah. general fund. Okay, so we've got, so let's say, let's just for conversation's sake, let me, let me make it easy. Let's say we got about $75 million worth of debt that we pay the principal and interest on every year like we pay our mortgages at home, right? So <coughs> if some of that 75 million is gonna finally get paid off in September of 20, and we have to wait until July 1 of 20 to implement these projects, because I can't imagine how we would do it in the same fiscal year that we're already working under. Uh, it could be a fairly smooth transition. So while it sounds like a lot of money, I don't think we should hit the panic button just yet until we understand how this is all gonna sort of work through the financial process to actually go in to get the money. Mr. Kamal, do you need anything from us? Not at this point. As I said at the beginning, this is an administrative update. <coughs> okay. Great. So moving forward, uh, we will now speak about the Eversource Electric, requesting permission to perform night work, South Street, West Main Street. Select Board will consider approving Eversource's, Eversource Electric's request to perform night work and working beyond the hours of the noise bylaw. The construction schedule will be Friday night through Monday morning, 24-hour workdays, 12-hour shifts, five crews through 17 weeks. The Town of Hopkins DPW issued a notice of hearing in order to show cause why permits should not be suspended or revoked on August 2, 2019 to Eversource Energy and United Civil Inc. The holders of a consolidated town road opening permit and trench safety permit Following a formal hearing, the town manager, as hearing officer, concluded that Eversource and United Civil violated applicable provisions of the town's street opening permit teams, condition, I'm sorry, terms, per, uh, conditions, and policy, Mass General Law, uh, Chapter 82A and 520 CMR 14.00, on two occasions while excavating that subject to compliance with certain conditions before recommencing excavation, the suspension of work pursuant to the permit should be lifted and the permittees allowed to complete their excavation in connection with Eversource's transmission line project. And that the hearing officer's decision be shared with the select board for filing and reference with respect to future applications for permits or other legal authorizations from Eversource 
and United Civil. The proposal reflects agreement between DPW Director and Eversource on the way forward. Um, so we will consider a request from Eversource, blah, 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 blah. Um, Mr. Kamala. Yes, um, through the chair, as you read um, in the introduction of this particular item, uh, we are here uh, because there was a, a suspension of the work that Eversource was performing on South Street. Uh, and as part of resolving that issue, um, Eversource was found at fault. Um, we also requested that the decision be uh, referred to the select board for your record and also for consideration in future um, discussions uh, of similar matters with Eversource. Uh, in addition, we also uh, felt that uh, the work should proceed and to that end, there were several meetings between Eversource and the DPW director resulting in the proposal uh, that is before the board tonight. <coughs> yeah, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Kamalo, thank you very much for the invite uh, for here tonight. My name is uh, Jack Lopes uh, with Community Relations with Eversource, and I'm with... Sean Lozier, also from Community Relations. Um, as mentioned on the article, if I could just make one quick correction on that article that was read, uh, you had mentioned about transmission lines. It's not, they're not transmission lines, they're distribution lines. It's the lines that actually feed the businesses and the residences uh, within the, the town. The transmission lines are the high voltage lines. Um, so it's, it's a different voltage. Um, we are here due to the suspension, uh, like it was mentioned, and we, uh, we've worked with the town uh, on a correction for that, and that's what we're here today to see if that correction would be approved uh, by the board, and uh, we could uh, continue with this project uh, next spring uh, during regular uh, construction season. Uh, I'm also here with uh, United Civil, our contractor, that's doing the work out there, so any questions, any uh, concerns, issues that you have, please let us know. Sean, are you United Civil? No, sir, I'm, I'm with Eversource as well. United Civil. Yeah, United Civil, were they the ones that, um, that caused the suspension, I mean the, um, the penalty? Correct. Was this the thing with the plates? Yes. Which you hit. Yeah. So, uh, so let's go to the board. <coughs> How many KV are you guys putting in there? Well, underneath, what is that, 15 kV or 35? Yeah, that's 13,800 13, 13, volts, which is uh, part of the expansion project that we did at the station where we installed the third transformer. Now we have that capacity available uh, for reliability issues in the town to make things be uh, better. Um, so now in order to get that power out of the station, uh, we need that duct bank with additional circuits. So I've worked in the electrical construction business and around 15 kV my entire life. I asked that question, and I'm still not convinced or understanding what was the issue, Mr. Kamala. Can you tell me in regular terms besides that what the problem was? Yeah, the issue was that the plates that were used to temporarily cover the trenches that had been dug mm -hmm. started moving and presented a public safety um, uh, concern uh, to the drivers using South Street. Uh, we received several complaints and filings uh, that we uh, forwarded to our insurance company. And also coincidentally, in fact, one of the town vehicles was damaged by one of the plates. And have you guys figured out what caused that? Uh, if I could bring, uh, bring up uh, uh, United Civil to answer those questions, it would be more appropriate for those uh, types. <coughs> How you doing? So the plates were moving, guys? Yes. Mm -hmm. And have you figured out why? Yeah, we have. Um, you know, there was a few different scenarios on, on why they moved. I think one of them, you know, we have engineered plating designs for all of our excavations that are based on traffic flow, weights of vehicles, so on and so forth. Um, we believe that the two incidents when it happened were um, likely overweight vehicles going at excessive speeds beyond what we anticipated. We've since had engineers take a look at our drawings, made a much more robust design for our road plates, 
Uh, we recessed them. We were actually able to use that design on Main Street successfully to finish um, the part that was in the, is it? The MDOT right away. MDOT right away without issue. Uh, but, you know, certainly we, we got off to a rocky start, um, not anticipating the amount of load that was going to get hit by these plates. So she's got a very small little economical car, very <laughs> conscientious about the environment, <laughs> and it moved on her. Yeah, so, um, it, I, I got a big bump. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't complain about it or anything, but I came off 495 and went over it, and it was a big bang, a big bump, and it, you could see it wasn't, it wasn't flush with the road after I another look at it okay at all <laughs> yeah part of our redesign was actually recessing the plates into the road originally they were setting on top of the road and they were pinned along the edges with railroad spikes and coal patch kind of a ramping um, we believe that's kind of what le led to the issue was you know the cars may be having kind of a point load when they went over the uh, the coal patch so the recessing uh, allows cars to travel without having any any major bumps but um, so I lived in Houston, Texas many years ago, and uh, on the Katy Freeway, which is I-10, I think, down there, uh, there were plates in place uh, one night. A car went by, the plates came off, another car went by, went into the ditch, two people died instantly. So, and sometimes at that intersection, people can go through there at 40 or 50 miles an hour when that light's green. Maybe they shouldn't, Chief, but they do. I never would do that. But, um, <laughs> You know, there's some speed can go through. So, you know, I just think back to that situation in Houston, Texas, when I lived there. It was horrific. Uh, we certainly would never want anything like that. So, it's a serious situation, and you know, you guys got to you got to do it right. I mean, we move plates in our business too. It's it isn't rocket science, but we got to get it done. But on the other hand, we need reliable feeders in the ground for our service in the community for electricity. Question really for Mr. Westerling, are you satisfied with the, uh, the solutions and everything they've come up with? Uh, sure. Um, through the chair. Turn that mic there towards you. Through the chair, the challenge was for Eversource and United Civil to come forward with a design that did not rely upon steel plates. And they did come forward with two. One of those was to construct and maintain Jersey barriers around the construction site for the entire duration that they were in that particular trench, which the police department and the DPW and the fire department rejected out of hand. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that they're proposing now is that they will start construction on Friday evening, work 24 hours per day until Monday morning, and have the entire trench protected and barricaded. And by Monday morning, they'll be able to pave it. So no steel plates will be involved. That will also reduce the construction period from a 50-week period, which would have had the barricades around, uh, to a 17-week period. So that's the one that we are endorsing. The reason that they're before the, the select board this evening is to be able to work nights uh, through the weekend. Okay. Good. I'm good. So Mr. Kamala, when the, uh, when the issue at hand was identified, who was it brought to? from you, from our, from the town, it was brought to whom? Eversource or United? Um, both. 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 Yeah. So uh, how were the people that were uh, guilty of causing this issue, how did they receive that and how did they react to that? In, in fact, um, part of my considerations uh, during the hearing was the fact that uh, in all the instances this these problems were brought to Eversource um, and the contractor's attention, they responded uh, immediately, though in an unsatisfactory manner. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is this also the job that they started on the wrong street? No. There's only two streets and I don't think, no, I don't think that was. Mr. Westerling? Wasn't there uh, an excavation done on Lumber Street? Lumber Street. That shouldn't have been? Uh, through the chair, or to the chair. Uh, that was done on West Main Street outside of the Mass DOT section. So they were, they had a cease and desist order from the town to not work on town roads, mm -hmm. but they did work at the intersection of Lumber Street on West Main Street, right in front of where the, uh, the Starbucks is. Yeah. And the, the con, Mr. Westling, yes. so the concept of 
those plates, those steel plates with railroad spikes into cold patch. How does cold patch, now I don't know, I'm just a nurse, but how does cold patch hold up to shock absorbing or, or how does it anchor in comparison to like a, a poured concrete or would you, would you say that a, a, a railroad spike through a, a metal plate would, would stop this from happening? On cold patch, not on hot top, on cold patch. To the chair, uh, that's what was employed on the construction sites and it was not effective. In fact, one of the steel plates, as was described earlier, fell into the excavation. Yeah. So I kind of know all this stuff. Um, and I'm okay with human error. I'm always okay with human error. If people make an honest mistake, I'm fine with that. What I'm not fine with is once it's identified, the deflection saying that it wasn't me, it wasn't my fault, it was someone else's fault, and doing that. Um, when, you know, Mr. Hurd just brought up a very valid point that people could die when it comes to this. So instead of strapping their boots on and saying, all right, let's take care of it right now, there was pushback and arguments, and that's the part that bothers me. You know, we've, in management, you, you don't always terminate someone for the offense that they make, you terminate them for the reaction of, of uh, when you identify the, the mistake. So that's the concern that I have um, with you guys. Um, I have lots of concerns with Eversource, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get into. Um, but if what you're saying, Mr. Westerling, the, uh, I waited for you to sit down. <laughs> so if what you're saying, Mr. Westerling, is so the problem was identified, a couple solutions were brought to you, one solution was thrown out, the other one is amenable to you, and it's amenable to your company, it's amenable to Eversource. Is there a reason why we wouldn't approve this tonight? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not believe there is a reason to not approve it. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the, the use of steel plates will not be employed in this solution. Okay. Is, that, is, is this firm DCAM certified? Yes, we are. So, Mr. Kamala, what do you need from us? <coughs> um, a motion from the board to approve Eversource Electric's request to perform night work and working beyond the hours of the town's noise bylaw. And you said that there were notices sent to the abutters if they had a concern, or they had, you had a meeting with the abutters concerned about the road work at night, and was no, there's none of that. Uh, Mr. Far up Chair, South Street is this going to be? Mr. Chairman, most of the corridor is uh, within the non-residential areas. There are a couple of homes down at the intersection of West Elm Street, uh, and as we get uh, even along uh, Hayward Street, you know there are some that are removed. Uh, but the previous night work that was accomplished, we didn't receive any complaints as of yet. So one of my concerns, and it kind of goes to a topic soon to be discussed tonight, which is the Main Street project. Um, you know, we've had a lot of contractors do different things, and different contractors do different things on Main Street, on Grove Street, and to your point earlier about you know, driving down Grove Street, Cedar you know, the, the, the black top they put down is sort of the temporary patch. They're just awful. Like, everyone's cars are getting banged all over the place. Um, you know, is there a way that we can regulate the quality of that patch that's going to be done so that we don't have people banging up cars more than we already have in town because of this other big project we're working on? There you go. <laughs> Your excuse. Uh, through the chair, um, it w the, the condition of the patch that's within Mass DOT's sector under Route 495 was brought to the attention of Eversource because that is particularly rough and ripply, uh, to use a technical term. Um, that was brought to their attention. No action has been taken to improve that yet. We are beyond the November 15th deadline for the winter moratorium. Uh, so that's one concern, is that we're going to have extended stretches of temporary patch. So I would put it back on Eversource and United Civil as to how they will ensure that we're going to have a smooth, smoother road out there than we see what they've done under Route 495. So am I to believe that 
the existing condition there that they're not going to come back and fix that before the winter? Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know. It was brought to their attention. We're beyond the November 15th winter moratorium deadline and no work was done there. Are the plants closed? Hot top plants closed? Do you have any intention of fixing what's wrong with that intersection right now with the roadway? The way that that item was left is that the Mass DOT was going to let us know if they had an issue with the condition of the pavement. We haven't received any, we've checked them down several times and we haven't received any kind of notification that they would like us to make any kind of alterations to that area. It's amazing how many people are going on that left lane, going towards the gas stations, and yeah. everybody's cutting over into the right. Yeah. I've seen a couple near accidents because no yeah. one wants to be traveling down that road. Yep. And so I live, uh, I live in that section of town, and when I'm coming off uh, West Elm, if I'm turning to go downtown, that left bumpy lane is my only option because I got traffic coming from the other side. And you're right. I mean, the first thing I'm doing is trying to trying to get out because that it's horrible if I may um, to United Civil I think as you have heard from the town when residents when drivers are not happy they do not call Mas Dioti they call the town <laughs> we have told you multiple times that area needs to be fixed therefore I don't think it serves this town for you to be waiting for MassDOT to f allow you to fix that. I think you already have your permit. You already have your street opening permit. We have told you, fix that patch. That's what we're asking for. So that said, I'm really not too inclined in allowing anyone to move forward on anything until things are done and fixed and done correctly. That's my inclination. What does that do to electric service reliability? Well, I mean, they're not going to do anything till the spring anyways, right? I mean, isn't that what we said, that, that this whole thing is here, you're done working now till the spring anyways? Sometimes we were out to work outside of the moratorium, I did. Okay, so now I'm a little bit more confused. <clears throat> so we're not here tonight to, quote, lift the moratorium and get this thing going again. Is that what you're saying? Because it's not going to happen right. till the spring anyway? Isn't that correct, Mr. M Mr. Kamala? No. I, per the decision issued, I have asked that the moratorium be lifted. Yeah. It is okay. the method of ap applying the solution agreed to that requires the select board to approve working on weekends and outside the town's noise bylaw. Okay, so we could do a motion to approve working on weekends and outside the yeah. town's bylaw, yeah. or whatever it is, yeah. as long as the patch uh, it's currently causing all kinds of angst for drivers is repaired, correct? That's the ask. So that's the way to do it. So they get what they want, we get... So if we say okay we today, when are you going to do this work? We'd be willing to do it right away. However, November 15th, we're no longer allowed to work on, on that area. But we're willing, to, we're willing to lift that, potentially. Yes, we're potentially... We would, we would move to do it right away. We would have to engage a pavement contractor. Yep. Uh, you know, that would take a, a little bit of time, but as quickly as possible. Through the chair, the winter moratorium, uh, the DBW, the Director of Public Works, we work with contractors to allow them to work as late as they can into the season, mm -hmm. as long as weather conditions are favorable and hot mix is available mm -hmm. to patch the trench. So we would be, if, if the board granted the ability to work Friday to Monday, we would look at the next weekend the work was proposed, and if it was conditions were favorable, we would allow it. If above freezing? Not, You're talking above freezing, no rain, stuff correct. like that. If they were not favorable, and we would be putting our own staff and fleet at risk if there was a need to uh, plow and sand and our motorists at risk, we would not allow it. So make no mistake about it. The way the road is, your plow staff is in danger. Yeah, lose two. Yes. You're absolutely in danger. Yes. You're in danger. Going through that, you're going to snap a cutting edge off that's going to go into another car or bolts that are going to go into another car. It, it's, it's worse than Hazard County in the 1980s. It's <laughs> horrible. Um, so I'd like a way to kind of hold their feet to the fire to make sure that this, is, this whole thing is, and if they can fix what's done and then start in the, in the spring or whatever, that's fine. But this is, 
the roads right now are, are absolutely horrible. Um, the road in general. So uh, I'm trying to figure out what we can do as a board to keep people, um, make them responsible, make this get done before the, the frost gets here and before they can, uh, you know, Trimount closes down and, 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 and. I, I, I want to get it done and I'm amenable to have you guys come back and finish the work. And if that means you come back on, on uh, what's today, Tuesday, if you, if you can come back on Friday, work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, get it done. And then by Tuesday, it's hot topped. Great. Great. But there has to be some type of mechanism in place to make sure that it's done and done right. Mr. Chairman, United Civil could be out on the road tomorrow coal planing and fixing that trench patch under Route 495. Yep. And if it's to our satisfaction, then they could come back this coming weekend, work Friday to Monday, if weather conditions are favorable. Okay. Pending inspection and approval yes. of the existing mess. So, if I could, uh, Mr. Kamal, you're closer to all this because you were in part of this hearing. Uh, do you have a motion that you would suggest the board should entertain that takes into account the need to progress with the project, but also take into account the concerns we have about the existing conditions? Um, yes, it is possible to construct a motion. However, through the chair, I do have a question for mm -hmm. uh, United Civil. How definitive is your commitment to fix the patch under 495? Very. And you'll complete that by when? We don't go plan and pay it, but we're going to have to reach out to payment contractors tomorrow. And if they were available as soon as Thursday, we, we, we would start right away. Immediately, upon availability of the payment. The reason I'm asking is, um, I'm thinking of suggesting a motion for the board that has a specific deadline by which that work will be done. Okay. I'd put 12-1 in there, Mr. Kamalo. I mean, let's be realistic about yeah. this week and next week and everyone's life and so on. Mm -hmm. So, we all know how accurate the weathermen are. I get the weather here in front of me. There's uh, bad It's not bad. We're you know, we're a few times we're going to hit at night 30 degrees, but you know, an inch of frost, half inch of frost is nothing. Uh, 42s, 43s, 30s, 44s, 40, 54, 50. So I don't think you're going to run into a frost deal. So I am a nurse, but in case I did work in the business for a little while myself, so uh, don't let the nurse moniker throw you off. Um, so I don't think the bash plant's going to shut down. Um, they're hungry, they want as much, they want to sell as much as they can. Um, the weather looks amenable. If you can talk to a, a, a paving company uh, tomorrow and get them done as quick as possible, um, I'm good as long as you know, we're cross, crossing all the T's and dotting the I's to make sure that legally that we're allowed to put said provisions in our acceptance here, saying that I'm okay for them to start the uh, the continuance of their excavation based on completion, satisfactory uh, inspection and approval from Mr. Westerling and or whoever else may or may not need to check it, MassDOT. Um, but we also, I don't want to put that off till the spring because, I mean, I, I want to have a very concrete date because it's very easy to say, yes, I'll do that and then say, uh, you know what, I'll see you in May. Uh, in May, I'll do it before I do your th your. Uh, so, Mr. Kamalo, with that said, I would be, I'd love to hear your motion. Yeah, the chair may request a motion to approve Eversource Electric's request to perform night work and working beyond the hours of the noise bylaw uh, with the following construction schedule, Fridays from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. on Monday mornings, 24-hour days, 24-hour work days, 12-hour shifts, five crews through 17 weeks, and subject to uh, Eversource uh, completing the repairs uh, on the mass DOT stretch on uh, West Main by December 1. 1 to the satisfaction of the town and mass DOT. I would add a word to that where it says and Eversource completing the thing first. Yeah. 
and first ever source completing blah 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 in other words they got to get that done then this regular stuff can begin thereafter guys december one with all due respect is effectively next wednesday you know with the, with the holiday weekend um you know th this construction activity is probably going to take more than one evening you know we're probably talking about five four to five night event uh which would mean you know we would have to start the next couple of days to cold a five-day process to coal plant and, and pave? I would, I would assume. So, so let's go. Okay, so let's go to 126, Friday the 6th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, the problem is, is once you start getting, I mean, I don't have any. It's too far out in the weather. Yeah, I can't well, tell. Um, you know, if. Um, so I think we also should put in on that that if the work isn't done by said date the van is not lifted like the the uh well, that's why it's first it's, this was yeah, right. the subject yeah. to first well i mean they'll still have to come if they don't get it done and they don't come back and see us until may they they still have to come see us before may you can't just because it you know the, the daylight the day i mean this comes and goes um it doesn't mean that this it, that everything is lifted, correct? So okay. this motion passes. Mm -hmm. They have to do this work before they can begin the other stuff they want to do. Yep. Okay. If they can't get this done for whatever reason, or they don't do it to the satisfaction of Mr. Westerling and the Mass DOT, they can't begin the other work they want to do, and they're going to have to come back to us because then they, they, there's no motion that says they can proceed. Okay. 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 Yeah. You may. Ultimately. Ultimately, uh, the United States works for us. Yeah. Any issues out there, please, we have to know what's going on. 28 Fruit Street. You got three double poles on oh, one year. Oh, God. Seriously, 28 Fruit Street. No, 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 no. We got a lot to do today. Come on. So, just let us know any issues that happen out there. Let us know. And we'll make sure things get done. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Any further discussion? So, all right. Nope. No further discussion here. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? Carried. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Town manager report. Mr. Kamalo. Yes. Um, Included in your packet is an update from the town manager regarding the Main Street Corridor project. Uh, and in addition uh, to the information I shared with the board through the packet, there are also two sets of information that I would like to share with the board. Um, as part of addressing some of the questions that are coming up pertaining to the citizen petition that um, is going to be considered at the December 9th special town meeting. Uh, some questions have come up with regard to two items that I want to share with the board. One is we have received questions regarding what would it take for the town to simply pave this Main Street Corridor project. So I'm sharing with you tonight the estimated cost as presented by the town's consultants. So this is from BHB, the engineering firm? Correct. Do we have copies for anyone in the public? Well, yeah, for members of the public. Um, Tim? Tim? This meeting's catered. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Dave? Yeah. This is going to fix my flu like symptoms. That's good. Yeah. I'm a nurse, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Terry? You hungry? <laughs> so, Mr. <laughs> Chair, if I could, please. Mr. Kamala, this, this estimate is put forward by VHB. But what does this include? So this is assuming the project doesn't go forward? 
Yeah. And this assumes that we're going to do everything we can or not everything we can. Is this is the intersection? Obviously, the intersection wouldn't be in this, correct? Um, in fact, I think for the benefit of the public as well as the board, um, I think Dev Daltore is here. He can explain exactly what is in this contract and what we may not be able to do that uh, alternatively can be accomplished if the Main Street Corridor project moves forward as was approved by town meeting. So this bottom line number at 4.68, uh, that would be borne by the town entirely? One Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. What was that number? 4.7 million dollars. Yeah. Which will be owned this by the, be if this does if this downtown quarter project does not go through to simply repave the downtown and get it up to par, not changing the intersection, it's four point seven million dollars. But would this include would this include well Dave's here. Dave sorry. Yes. So David, does this include sidewalks? New yeah. sidewalks? Yeah, the estimate in front of you is the it's an overlay of Main Street from Wood Street to Ash Street, which is pretty much grind up the first inch and a half of pavement and you put an inch and a half down. Um, in the same place, there's no changes to the curbs. There's no realignment of the intersection. Um, there's no undergrounding. Uh, there's no bike lanes. Um, no new traffic signals. Um, and it's repairing the existing sidewalks. Repairing, which is what does that mean? Like patching holes um, or the existing, whole new That's an estimate is, is, to, is to replace all three inches of the existing uh, pavement on the sidewalk. Um, Concrete? Um, I, oh boy, I think it's, um, what's there now? If, concrete? If it's concrete now, it would be Fix. concrete. Um, but there's no new curbing, it would be resetting the existing curb. Mm -hmm. um, would it be adding sidewalks to places where there's no sidewalk on one side or the other? No, it's just, it's a simple um, new pavement is more or less what you get. And it's, it includes the infrastructure for the drainage improvements um, because that's, we consider that a necessity as part of the, the project, is upgrade the existing drainage system, which is, which is insufficient right now. And Mr. Del Toro, when we do that, does that, once everything's ground up before we resurface, would that put us, uh, would, it, would that make us be required to make existing parking spots to uh, current acceptable size? Yeah, I would think we'd re recommend the striping um, so meet, regular, meet current standards, which so there'd be offsets from curb cuts. There'd so be, we, would uh, lose, we would lose some parking spots in correct. addition to spending correct. a significant more amount of money out of our pocket for this project. Correct. Thank you. And the other one is be no changes to uh, Marathon Way was the other. Everything would okay. kind of stay the same. Yeah. And yeah. The Doughboy would stay the same. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I'm also, there's also, there have been questions uh, raised regarding uh, transparency related issues. I'm sharing with you a listing of all the meetings that <coughs> have been had uh, with regard to this project where public input has been sought, dating back to 2003 when the town held the Voices for Vision brainstorming sessions. So this, th these are all the, the meetings that have been held, that have been po publicly posted and held in conjunction with the downtown revitalization it, project? Yes, and other efforts, and other efforts that have been held to uh, gather input from the public. Um, in addition, um, there have also been questions regarding the bike lanes, and I have two documents that I want to share with the board and the public. Um, this is the visions of all concerns. Yes. Kamal, if I can, yeah. please. So before we get into other documents, um, I'm a little so in in 
This says in October of 2009, the town submits a project need form to Mass Highway. Is that similar to a statement of interest by the school department and the Board of Selectmen for a new school? Is that like a kickoff process with, for state funding or something? Yes. yes. You state the problem, you state what the need is. and So that was the initial step. It appears that would be the initial step with the state to get the funding, the TIP funding. Is that a fair statement? Correct. And that's in 2009. Yeah. Who is the Conway School of Design Public Forum? It's the Conway School of Design that was brought in by the town. Um, and in fact, um, they were also responsible for developing the two documents that I want to share with the board. So again, I think what you, you will see is that uh, from its beginnings in 2003 with the Voices of Vision brainstorming session and the creation of the Downtown Revitalization Committee, what is now the Main Street Corridor Project has gone through many revisions and changes over the years as it now approaches its final solution. Um, the document I shared with you uh, lists some of the major milestones uh, including the creation of multiple committees, public and town board meetings, consultant reports, community outreach events that have been compiled to show the significant effort uh, made to involve the Hopkinton community in the plans for the project. Uh, public forums have also been held to provide project updates and to gather resident input, uh, and we have highlighted those in yellow. Including meetings at the select board, uh, the updates to the planning board. Uh, there's also information that was produced in relation to the town meeting articles that have uh, gone through our legislative process. Uh, in, in, in summary, the long list of milestones represents the effort of many committees, individuals, and town staff to move the project forward towards a final solution that addresses aspects of each of the three transportation goals laid out, and I need to underscore this, laid out in the town's master plan adopted in April 2017. One, improve and maintain the existing transportation system to provide adequate service to accommodate future growth. Two, provide alternatives to automobile transportation, including bicycle and pedestrian facilities and networks. And finally, improve public safety by addressing the problematic and hazardous intersections. Again, that was in what year? The master plan was adopted in 2017. Uh, we have also um, we have also identified. Uh, we've been trying to track this document back in 1952, 1956. This issue was being discussed, uh, and we will make that document available for, for the I think public. We have plenty here. <laughs> yeah, 56. Yeah. Two or 56, mm -hmm. I do believe we have one historian who may remember that. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry might have been at the meeting. Mr. Terry, were you at that meeting? <laughs> <laughs> were you at that meeting in 1952 when we first brought this up? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't care then. Yeah. Again, um, in, in terms of the bike lane, Here's the visions of Hopkinton document that I want to share with the board. Two, four, five. Here we go. And then there's also the, the bikeable Hopkinton document. And in fact, this was the um, context that developed the concept for the separated bike lanes. So let's back up one sec. So this visions of Hopkinton, where did this come from? Uh, through the downtown. Is that Conway School? Yeah, pre yeah, yes, for yeah, prepared for the Downtown Revitalization Committee. And this yeah. was winter 2010. 2010. And then in 2015, the, Hop the Bikeable Hopkinton uh, report was presented in public, uh, which led to the concept of the separated bike lane. And that's which report is that? Oh, Bikeable Hopkinton. And these were all published as obviously yeah. at various times. You guys all have one of these? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, next year. 
This bikeable Hopkinton is from what date, Mr. Kamal? It's 2015. 2015. Is this the Upper Charles Trails Committee was involved in this? Correct. As well? Yes. Because I've heard from them about that. So. Do we have copies of these reports to the public? I believe so. Okay. Is this all on the Within the next couple of days. <laughs> it's all in town, okay? Yes. It's yes. not yep. clear. Yes. So is this information that would be in order to present at the special town meeting or? And it's a citizen petition. I. This is up to the moderator. It's up to the moderator. Yeah. But again, I think it may be helpful again to reiterate to the public that this information is available for public review on the town website. Okay. Okay. I guess I'm just a little yes, surprised, question. Mr. Chair, that, and where are we with these documents as far as, are these on the, did I hear something about the website? Are these on the website? Have these been on the website? Are these on ClearGov? I assume over the years they've been up and down, or no? I'm not sure they're specifically on ClearGov right now. I think they're in the town webpage yes. somewhere. But in the years they were out and circulated, these were circulated. Oh, yes. Sure. Yes. I remember the visions of Hopkinton. I don't remember the bikeable Hopkinton, honestly. In 2015, we were on the board because this was brought also to a select board meeting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Chairman of the, uh, the Planning Board, I wanted to let you know in response to um, a very reasonable request by many members of the Select Board at our last meeting that we will consider and take a vote in support of, um, uh, that's an up or down thing obviously, I'm not promising support, but we will consider all of this information. We appreciate um, that it's all been put together in a format that we can research and be prepared. Um, we're just going to make um, and make an official vote as a planning board before special town meeting at our next meeting on the 25th. Great, thank you. Thank you. I guess in summary, of, are we ready to move on? Yes. I, I, you know, for me, uh, having been around a while, along with colleagues in the room, uh, this transparency thing has kind of chewed on me a little bit as I hear it in the in the community that we're not transparent about a project that we've been talking about forever, um, and then to see this. It's a little bit overwhelming because I kind of looking through here going, I remember that. I, remember, I mean, I'm looking back at sort of my life here the last 15 years. Um, there's been a lot of transparency in my view looking at this. I, I assume we can click on to these things if there's an electronic document. Correct. Can we get, there, there were, yes, can you circulate an electronic document to the board and make that available to the public? Because if you can click on this, then I don't have to go find another piece of paper, right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're working on it. There's links to videos of the meetings and there's links to sign sheets and that, that would be very helpful to help the community understand that in fact their town government has worked hard to put it out that this is what we're working on okay thank you any other board members have anything on that yeah. no mr kamala moving forward yeah i i, I think the the take from our tonight's discussion is that uh, the board is encouraging us to distribute this information as widely as possible yeah, um, including doing press releases. I would think that we should get this out to our friends. Post haste. In, in the media, sure. Yeah. Sure. Is that it? That's all. All right. Uh, where is my sheets here? Uh, what a budget, uh, about a budget update? Yeah, a uh, budget update. I wanted to let the select board know um, we 
are getting a good sense as to what the budget might look like. Um, we have received the budget submissions from town departments. Uh, we have also received indications from uh, our school colleagues as to what their budget might look like. Thank you, Mr. Kamala. Okay. Uh, liaison report. Uh, I attended the school committee meeting the other night uh, during their budget discussion for a few minutes. I got to listen in. Uh, growth in the schools continues to be uh, at a very uh, vigorous pace. Uh, we have great schools. Those schools are doing a great job with the children of Hopkinton and they're producing great candidates or, or graduates that are great candidates to go on to college or do other things in their life as they so choose. Um, you know, the community is attracting a lot of people uh, because of that and uh, also because of that, the cost to operate the schools is increasing and we're gonna have to be very mindful and figure out how we balance this all out in the coming months. Uh, uh, I think some of us have received emails from concerned folks that we're not supporting the schools because we didn't do it in the budget message a month ago. And I explained uh, to the school committee members, they knew that, but I wanted to kind of get it to their constituent crowd watching that uh, the process is very early and that um, we'll do everything we can to support the strong, very strong asset in our community, being the schools, uh, but not to hit the panic button too early because we're well early in the process. And I also suggested that because of the special town meeting, the focus on the budget, which would be very intense at this point in a normal year for the next three weeks, it's just physically impossible to do that and prepare for a special town meeting and all that's involved. So we may be a little bit delayed this year, and Tim, bear with us too, because uh, we're not necessarily going to be able to get everything done we need to get done, but we'll get at this, and I'm sure we'll create a successful budget at the end of the day. Okay. That was my message to the school committee. Okay. Mary Jo is not here. Uh, so um, I attended the uh, planning board meeting, uh, the, the most recent planning board meeting, um, along with Mr. Herr and Mr. Catino, and uh, they were discussing a lot uh, the Main Street Corridor project. Um, deliberating on it. I think ultimately um, Ms. Kramer just now said that they would be holding a vote, um, but at the time they felt uh, a little uncomfortable uh, thinking they, they, believing they needed more information. Okay. Good, so uh, Veterans Celebration Committee, we had a, a really nice uh, dinner and a, a good celebration for our veterans at the uh, Woodville Rod and Gun as well as uh, a wonderful ceremony at the Hopkins Senior Center. Uh, Carolyn Dykema was there. She was a, an absolutely wonderful speaker as always. Um, many, of, uh, many of our esteemed and revered veterans in town were there. Uh, you know, kind of working your way through the crowd, you get to hear the tidbits of, the, of some of their stories, which are, uh, you know, when you, when you look at your, you know, for me a bad day is hitting 20 minutes of traffic getting where I need to go and these guys are trying to find a way off the beach at Iwo Jima. Uh, it kind of puts a lot of things into perspective. Um, so that was, as suspected, a, a, a wonderful event. Uh, last night I attended the um, elementary school building committee uh, meeting for the marathon school. We are close to getting all our final bills done in and paid, and uh, our lead certification taken care of, and uh, we'd be able to, at some point, I, I hope to be able to give you an exact to the dollar number of how much under budget we were. I believe it's in the realm of $2 million, um, and that was with the additional four classrooms that were added, so kudos to that, that group, uh, especially to Joe Markey and Mike Shepard keeping everyone on their toes uh, and open space we met the other day and I didn't go because I was stuck in traffic in Maine so um, that's that that's all I had and Mary Jo's not here so um, that being said future agenda future agenda items Mr. Herr did you Mr. have here I would ask that we have a future agenda item be a joint meeting with the Hopkinton Board of Assessors and the Hopkinton Select Board to review the uh, calculations used in the commercial property sector, uh, including and understanding better the income calculations that are part of that process. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nothing. 
And then the only thing I wanted to add, that I wanted to add before uh, Chief Lee left, was we touched on it very briefly. Uh, they had a, a very, very serious call yesterday that, um, you know, multiple Hopkins departments assisted in in the apprehension of uh, an armed robber in many towns. So when you say multiple departments, you generally think police and fire. It was police and DPW. One of our DPW employees uh, got the uh, be on the lookout broadcast, uh, located the vehicle, and called it in. Uh, many towns converged on that vehicle. Uh, the person came out of the house that they were actively second into. house, right? A second, at least the second house in Hopkins. Well, um, with a uh, potential deadly weapon. And the, the, uh, our very well-trained police department um, uh, took care of the issue without using lethal force, which was um, <coughs> absolutely uh, wonderful. And I would, not have, uh, I would not have cited them had they used lethal force, but they didn't. And that just goes to show what, how well-trained they are and, and what an absolutely wonderful police department we have here. So. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's nice to be able to hear stories like that in society when it's so quick to point fingers and say, uh, uh, we won't get into that. But they, they did a, a really, really good job, and, and they should be very, very proud of themselves. I know that we are. Um, I, will, uh, I will reach out to the EPW employee who was uh, uh, kind of paramount in that apprehension and, and thank him personally. And um, I wish Chief Lee was here to take some of the accolades. So I told him the job that his department did was, <coughs> we'd love to hear this, clearly outstanding. I saw that, thank you. <laughs> so I, I saw that, I was gonna reply, and I'm like, so, nope, I'm not gonna reply. So, yes, yeah. so that's all I'm gonna say on that. Uh, I believe we're all set. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, abstain. None that carries. Thank you. Have a good night. So, Mr.